Et je commence quand même. Bon, let's go. J'y vais, hein, salut. Ok. Bonjour à tous. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jean-Baptiste Tenquin. Uh, I am the Secretary General of ESPCI. And it is a great honor for me to introduce this first edition of Silicon Valley Comes to Paris. First, I would like to say on behalf of our president, Marie Christine Le Mardelet, of our director, Jean François Joigny, Jean Louis Missica, representative of the Anne Hidalgo, um, thank you for coming to our American guest, Emai Partasa Rati. Uh, she's with the press, she's going to join us in a few minutes. Reid Hoffman, uh, Steve Quake, and Tony Fadel. It's not so common to have to organize an event with such, with so many well-known and respected experts in the same place in Paris. And as I just said, we are deeply honored. Your presence here is a proof, a proof of your interest in our country, in our capital, Paris, in our city and in this unique institution called ESPCI. ESPCI, I'm sorry, in French we like acronyms, means Superior School of Chemistry and Physics of the City of Paris. It was created in 1882 by scientists who wanted to build a school open to science, open to innovation, in the very heart of Paris. And these pioneers, these scientific entrepreneurs, had a strong belief in truth. They wanted to challenge conventional wisdom, to learn from failure, to break down barriers between the laboratory and the economy. And this was quite original at the time. And this is why Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, Frédéric Joliot Curie, Paul Langevin came and worked here. So they discovered radium, the sonar, air liquefaction, and they had tremendous impact on society. More than a hundred startups were created here in, at ESPCI in Paris. Long before uh, the startup nation was created in France last year. So this adventure is still going on with discoveries like ultra-fast wave imaging and vitrimers, which were invented here at ESPCI a few years ago only. So this place shares a common culture with Silicon Valley. And for us today, this is the beginning of, a new, of new exciting connections between Silicon Valley and Paris. Paris scientific entrepreneur. This is our bet, and I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Jean-Louis Missica, Deputy Mayor of Paris. Uh, it's uh, a very great honor, but it's also a pleasure on behalf of uh, Mayor Hidalgo uh, uh, to uh, welcome you here in the ESPCI. Some of you know that uh, I've been the chairman of the board of uh, ESPCI during six years, between uh, uh, 2008 and uh, uh, 2014. So, uh, and after that, <coughs> Marie-Christine Le Mardelet uh, succeeds, and uh, uh, she's uh, 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 a wonderful uh, uh, chairwoman of, uh, of, of the board. But this uh, school uh, is, uh, is a very special one and uh, I will not uh, tell you why because you will discover it uh, during the, this afternoon. Um, as uh, 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 you have heard, the, uh, this school has a, a lot of uh, Nobel Prizes uh, in its uh, uh, history. Uh, but it's not only a question of research, it's also a question of, uh, of training and uh, uh, what is uh, the most uh, interesting and specific 
uh, uh, specialty of this school is that, that uh, when you are a student, the first thing to do, you, you have to do, is to go in a laboratory and to make research. And uh, it's learning by doing research. And this learning by, do, by doing research is very specific uh, to uh, 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 ESPCI. And there is also another thing which is important. It's, uh, it's uh, the eye of uh, uh, ESPCI, which means industrial. <coughs> and uh, there is a special relationship uh, between uh, uh, industry and entrepreneurship and, uh, and this, uh, this school. Uh, talking uh, about the relationship uh, between uh, the industry world uh, and, and uh, the, the research, Pierre-Gilles de Gênes, who, who, who is not only a Nobel Prize, but have uh, uh, directed this school during 27 years, uh, used to say that both have uh, everything to gain by working together. And uh, in Paris, uh, we have uh, built bridges between uh, some of the best scientific schools and research institutes uh, of, uh, of the city. We have created a, a vibrant innovation ecosystem and uh, uh, numerous uh, life uh, uh, science companies. Uh, you may know uh, that Paris has the highest number uh, of researchers in, uh, in Europe and uh, is the first city in Europe uh, for patents. Uh, it also uh, accounts for internationally renowned uh, research institute. Of course, the Pierre Gilles de Gênes Institute for uh, Microfluidics, where, uh, is, uh, with, which is hosting us, uh, but also the Imagine Institute to Cure Genetic Diseases, not far from here, the Institut Langevin, which is a world leader for the use of uh, waves in uh, medical imaging and uh, uh, is part of uh, ESPCI, the Institut de la Vision, dedicated to research in ocular disease, and the ICM, Institute for Brain and Spinal Cord Research, uh, which is a, a, a very interesting institute working together with uh, 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 ES, uh, ESPCI. Paris has created a, a favorable ecosystem for innovative companies with a favorable tax environment for R&D industries, uh, but also plenty of incubators, co-working spaces, and fab labs, which transform the city into a giant living lab. Paris now accounts for 36 incubators or accelerators, including the world's uh, biggest startup campus, Station F. Some of you know knows it uh, very well. And uh, we have also 3,000 square meters of facilities dedicated to life science. For example, Biopark, Paris Biotech Santé, Agoranov, the Boussico incubators. And we are working hard with uh, uh, the government to create a, a, a new station F dedicated to uh, life, uh, life science and, uh, and uh, biotech. Last but not least, and you know it very well, Paris is also one of the most attractive cities for scientific leaders, thanks to its exceptional quality of life. Paris has a unique cultural offer and is the capital of gastronomy, and it has one of the most effective academic systems, a unique public transport network, and the best health care service uh, you can imagine in Europe. So there is a clear momentum for the interest of investors for French startups, and the bi biotech medtech transfer startup scene is now booming in Paris. Paris probably has now uh, uh, a very big biotech cluster in Europe with 56 companies within the border of the Région Île-de-France. And uh, I want to, in conclusion, say some words about some uh, success we had uh, in, in this field. The first French biotech to be listed on the NASDAQ was DBV Technologies. Uh, which has recently raised uh, 255 million euros. Among the long list of uh, startups funded by ESPCI engineers, you may know Supersonic Imaging, a medical ultrasound company featuring innovative ultrasound systems, Capsum, which creates new body products thanks to microfluidics, or Ecosense, specialized is in non-invasive diagnostic products and service for hepatology. Uh, a last recent example from uh, another uh, incubator, Paris Biotech Santé, is Eligo Bioscience, which developed the first biotherapeutic therapeutic nanobots, which enables to fight against antibiotic resistance. They have just secured 20 million euros 
Series A from the US fund Kosla Ventures. And this is the first investment of this American fund in Paris. As you can see, Paris is a fertile ground for innovative companies. So yes, uh, it's time for uh, investors all over the world to invest in Paris and to invest in companies in the uh, uh, ESPCI. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Céline Curiol, I'm a writer and a journalist and I'll be one of the moderators for uh, today's conference. So I'll be giving a short uh, presentation of each of the speaker before he or she speaks and uh, we'll start right away with, with the first distinguished guest of our wonderful program, who is Mr. Stephen Quake. Uh, Mr. Quake is a Lee Otterson Professor of Bioengineering and Applied Physics at Stanford University. He's also the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, which was established in 2016. Mr. Quake's research combines biology, physics, and technology development and he has created many, develop, uh, many measurement tools for biology, including DNA sequencing technologies and non-invasive diagnostic tools. So please welcome Mr. Quake. Thank you. It's wonderful as ever to be back in Paris. This really is my favorite city in the world, I have to say. Um, <coughs> We're getting, I have a few slides, we're getting it set up, and I, I thought I'd talk today a little bit about my journey from basic science to Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship, and you know, certainly my training was, was in theoretical physics and mathematics, and I worked on, uh, on, on sort of very fundamental things earlier in my career, and then uh, made this transition to uh, more applied research, and it's one that you know, it happened sort of organically, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I'll tell you a bit about that story and uh, about the role of Europe and in particular France in that story. Um, okay, so <coughs> Pierre Gilles needs no introduction to this group, I think, and uh, I, I got to meet him a few times later in my career, but early in my career when I was a student, um, what I found in the library was his book, uh, Scaling Concepts in Polymer Physics, which I devoured, I read it cover to cover, and it became uh, sort of like an instruction manual for me for everything I wanted to do experimentally because it was such an elegant description of, uh, of the world of polymer physics and, and uh, sort of laid out what was known, what wasn't known, and uh, inspired uh, a lot of my work early in my career. Um, and in particular, I was, you know, I did my first training as a theorist, then became an experimentalist, and uh, was interested in single molecule biophysics, grabbing on the molecules, stretching them, measuring forces, using DNA as a model polymer to ask or to answer some of the questions that Dijen had posed in his book and in his work. Um, this was work we had done uh, where we used optical tweezers to tie a knot in DNA and ask what happens is you have a non-trivial topology and to track the diffusion of the knot and measure the diffusion constant. And uh, the theory that I developed to describe that was, again, very much inspired by the uh, approaches to Gen used. Um, and it's very natural then to say, well, we're using DNA as a model polymer um, and we're looking at its sort of physical properties as a very long molecule. Say, so can we use the same sorts of techniques or related techniques to get the biological information out of the DNA as well? And in particular, got in, we got interested in designing single molecule experiments to read out the sequence of DNA. Uh, and using very sensitive microscopy and single fluorophore imaging, uh, my students and I eventually figured out a way to read out sequence information from single molecules. And we used that as a way to study uh, the polymerase, but also to get the information out of the DNA. And even though the first experiments were, uh, uh, you know, just uh, uh, the most basic proof of principle um, and you know, rather pathetic in terms of what sequencing technology was even in those days, uh, we realized that the potential for parallelism of this approach was awesome. And with a little bit of work, it could very quickly become a sequencing technology that far outstripped anything else that was there. Um, and so we founded a company to do that and went from a few dozen templates of DNA being sequenced at a time to millions of templates um, to billions of templates. And that was the first uh, commercial device made by Helicos, and it was at the time the world's fastest, cheapest sequencer. And <coughs> uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of 
uh, controversy at the time about you know what the technical needs were to sequence the human genome. So the very first thing we did with one of the earliest instruments was to sequence my genome with it, and that uh, you know sort of marked uh, a pretty major career transition for me from looking at sort of very basic biophysics to getting into uh, biotech tools development and using the tools to ask questions about human genetics. And at the time. Uh, uh, this illustrates all the human genomes that have been sequenced. This is a table from the paper. Um, and you can see that the pace of innovation was really, really staggering uh, by virtually any metric. Cost, for sure, um, per genome. Uh, and it didn't stop in 2009. I mean, the, the pace has continued to be frenetic. And now we've knocked off almost two more zeros from the cost of doing a human genome. Um, we collectively, the community, I should say, uh, not me personally. Uh, in terms of amount of hardware required by machine runs, the manpower required as number of authors on the paper, um, all these things marked the transition from the genome being kind of an epic project requiring huge teams to something that could be done by one, one professor in a lab. And is from you know, sort of harnessing this, uh, uh, these instrument and, and, and measurement improvements that this became possible. And so this was my entree into human genetics. And you know, it was, it was very interesting. I wanted to do it to show it could be done. I was interested to see what my genome could tell me. There's a whole other story in that. Um, but it was also clear that the field of human genomics was dominated by uh, sort of who could collect the most money and spend it the fastest. And, and that wasn't a race that I particularly wanted to get in. Um, and so rather than uh, sort of continue down that path, I made another turn. Um, and I sort of made this philosophic commitment that, you know, I wanted to stay in this field, but I would only have one machine. And I would only do the kind of science you could do with a single machine and not needing a warehouse or huge facilities. And so, uh, I decided I wouldn't pursue human genome sequencing. I find other ways to use these machines. And uh, what I sort of stumbled upon was another problem um, that hadn't been connected to genomics at that point. And it was a question of, uh, of, of doing prenatal diagnostics. And so uh, aneuploidies, having an extra copy of a chromosome, are the most common genetic disorders for live births. And these happen enough that doctors have decided that uh, 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 people should be screened for this. And if you're a certain risk group, you should do an invasive test like amniocentesis. Um, but these invasive diagnostics uh, have risks, both for the fetus and for the mom. Uh, and it seemed to me crazy that you had to risk the life of your unborn child to ask a diagnostic question. And this was a very personal thing for this. My daughter survived this procedure, and my son survived this one. Uh, and it just seemed like you know there ought to be a better way. And so it was in the back of my mind to think that this was an important problem to work on, a non-invasive way to measure genetics of, of, of fetuses. And, uh, what ended up being sort of the key fundamental phenomenon to solve that problem is something that also was first discovered here in France. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it was worked by uh, Paul Mendel in Strasbourg, uh, who was a physician there and, and ran the Institut de Chimie Biologique. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, he discovered this amazing phenomenon called circulating cell-free DNA, which is to say uh, that there is uh, DNA that circulates in your blood that's not part of the nucleus of cells anymore. It's the detritus from dead cells. Cells have died. The nucleus breaks. The cell breaks open. The nucleus breaks open. The genome goes out in the blood. It gets chewed up into little pieces. And those little bits of DNA circulate in the blood. And he, he did this as a purely chemical discovery, okay? Uh, so the, he published the paper. This is the key paper. Uh, and uh, 1948, okay? And so, you know, this was just a few years after Oswald Avery had proved that DNA is the molecule of inheritance. Very few people believed Avery, uh, and if you read the paper. Uh, and, and so these guys, Mandel and Matthias, they had just said, we're going to approach this as a chemistry problem. DNA is a chemical. Let's see if it's there in the blood. Um, and, and they looked and they found it. Um, <clears throat> and this is the data from their paper. You can see they looked at people, normal subjects, people with various afflictions. One affliction was pregnancy. Um, and they noted that in the case of pregnancy, there was higher values, more DNA in the blood. And <coughs> it, it, it was sort of an amazing discovery that was completely forgotten. Uh, so this paper languished in, uh, in sort of 
uh, in, in the dusty archives, uh, you know, it was never cited for, for decades. We, I, I only learned about it. The field lived on. People remember that this phenomenon existed, um, but they forgot that Mandela discovered it. And, you know, it was sort of this funny little corner of people doing cancer uh, uh, studies that they were looking at tumor DNA in the blood. And I only learned about this paper through a, a reference in a review article that uh, uh, I've only seen it cited once uh, before I got involved in the field. But it was a really, you know, in retrospect, momentous and important discovery. Um, <clears throat> and most people, you know, to the extent the field lived on, were focused on cancer because the genome of the tumor is a little different than your human genome. And so people wanted to use that as a marker of tumor progression. And this role of pregnancy, um, which was first hinted at here, was forgotten and then rediscovered in 1997 in Oxford. Um, in the lab of Jim Wainscote, um, who was able to use molecular biology, which had been invented in the interim, to prove that some of the DNA in the blood of a pregnant woman comes from the baby, from the fetus. And they did that by looking at women who were pregnant with male babies and observing the presence of male chromosome DNA in the blood of these women, um, <coughs> which shouldn't happen, right? It's the male sex chromosome. And it was only present when they were pregnant with the fetus. After delivery, it disappeared very quickly. And so that showed that some of the DNA in the blood is from the baby. Um, and this now provides the route to answer this question of how do you analyze the genetics of the baby without putting a needle right up next to the fetus? There are some in the mom's blood. A very small amount, it's only a few percent, um, and it's mostly mom's DNA there. Uh, but there's a little bit of baby's DNA. And this paper in 97 kind of set off uh, a long odyssey to find a way to capitalize on this phenomenon, to build a real diagnostic, to understand the genetics of the fetus. And people tried a lot of things that didn't work. Uh, and it was a very challenging measurement problem um, for a variety of reasons, which I won't dwell on. But ultimately, we cracked it at Stanford. Uh, my student, Christina Fan, myself, our collaborator, Yair Blumenfeld. Uh, and the answer was kind of ridiculously simple when you come to it from the perspective of biophysics. Our early work in single molecule biophysics that I had done had gotten me very used to counting molecules. And I realized, oh, we should use the sequencer as a molecular counter. And uh, if you are able to count molecules and work out which chromosome they derive from, you can measure uh, very small changes in the, in the amount. And in particular, if the baby has an extra copy of chromosome 21, for example, which is Down syndrome, uh, even in the sea of normal maternal DNA, you can measure the slight excess of chromosome 21 relative to the other chromosomes. And so we showed that using high throughput sequencers uh, and we're able to measure this. Uh, in this case, uh, this is chromosome 21, the excess of chromosome 21 molecules rather to other, relative to others in the presence of women who are pregnant of babies with Down syndrome as compared to normal. And of course, this works with any chromosome, not just 21. We can measure other trisomies and aneuploidies, chromosome 18, chromosome 13. Those are the next most common ones. And this kind of uh, sort of really uh, unleashed a whole new field of liquid biopsies because it combined this phenomenon of cell-free DNA with the molecular counting one could do with next generation sequencers that I and others helped invent. Um, <clears throat> and we published this result in 2008. It got people very, very excited. It was replicated independently within a few months. A uh, number of companies and, and uh, university hospitals started clinical trials. Within a few years, those trials read out on thousands of women. Uh, and it all worked the way we said it would. This counting argument is pretty simple, a basic law of statistics. And, uh, and it got launched in the clinic um, and was adopted very quickly. Went from half a million to a million women per year. In 2016, it was three million women. And correspondingly, the use of invasive tests, the ones that have risk to the mom and the baby, have gone down enormously, as much as 70% as measured in some studies. So uh, 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 that was sort of my first entree and transition from uh, uh, sort of biophysics to diagnostics. And this phenomenon of cell-free DNA was one that's continued to be uh, very good to us. And it crops up in many other situations where it provides a useful uh, non-invasive diagnostic where a simple blood test can replace invasive biopsies that are risky and painful for patients. Um, and right now there's uh, versions of, of this approach that are used on organ transplant recipients, heart and kidney transplant recipients um, to avoid biopsies to measure rejection after the operation. Um, there's versions used for infectious disease diagnostics, uh, in particular for infections that are, that are deep in places where 
you know, you just it's not practical to to sample material, uh, and uh, and 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 of course in cancer, um, that field has continued, and they've adopted the methods we developed for pregnancy. They're now revolutionizing cancer diagnostics as well, and so uh, it's it's really been a wonderful thing to see the field grow and mature, and it is uh, uh, improving healthcare for large numbers of people. Um, the other sort of thread of my research that uh, I pursued over the years, and I had no idea when I started learning about polymers from Dijen's book that you know, I would spend years and years actually practically making things out of polymers, and the theoretical knowledge went to very practical things about how to make flexible devices. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I was interested in trying to find ways to automate biology, and automating sequencing was one way to do it, but the more general problem in biology is how do you automate liquid manipulation? Uh, you know, as a physicist, I like to tinker in the lab, play with lasers, optics, build things. That I loved. I had a harder time accepting that I would have large teams of people just pipetting things all day. Biology solves a lot of problems by brute force, and so I wanted to find ways to to automate biology. And microfluidics, a way to do automated plumbing, uh, struck me as a very powerful way to do it. And it was sort of an old idea, um, you know, dating back to the late 70s, uh, where people began to make chromatographs and inkjet printers out of silicon devices. Uh, and, you know, the whole world of, of silicon fabrication for electronic circuits uh, 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 became useful as a tool to make uh, mechanical devices and fluidic devices. But what really sort of carried the day at the end was this rubber, um, these, these plastic devices, these polymeric devices, um, using replication techniques pioneered by folks like George Whitesides. Uh, we adopted them and figured out how to build very high density uh, devices that were like integrated circuits, but instead of having wires and transistors, they had pipes and valves and pumps and so forth. And this was one of the uh, uh, ones we were able to make where we were first feeling like we were doing something like large-scale integration. Uh, in this case, thousands of valves on a chip. Here the channel's been filled with food coloring. You can see the complexity. And this, for us, was a way to automate biology. And we explored a number of areas of biology, ranging from uh, uh, structural biology and protein crystallization to, uh, 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 to single-cell genomics, to chemical synthesis. And again, it was a very sort of fruitful, interesting area that let us sort of explore problems in basic science and also build tools to help other people uh, automate their efforts. And here's one of the movies one of my students made showing the kind of manipulations one can do with different kinds of food coloring. Um, I ended up founding a company called Fluidime. They made these commercially. They figured out how to go from a little bit of a lab project to something that would work every time. They eventually, uh, uh, you know, back in 2011, had worked out that they had fabricated and shipped more than a billion such valves around the world, and uh, it's been many billion more since then. And their devices are just works of art, very elegant, and have gone well beyond uh, what we were able to do as academics. Um, and seeing that transition from the lab to something commercial was also fantastic. Um, we continued to explore other sorts of microfluidics in the lab. Uh, my student, Todd Thorson, figured out he could create a little instability by having water and oil come together in a channel. And just like making an emulsion uh, in your salad dressing, these microfluidic emulsions uh, allowed us to uh, sort of discretize fluid droplets and trace things. He did all kinds of wonderful geometries. This became another thriving subfield of microfluidics. And these things were sort of hypnotic. They would generate droplets and go on forever and ever, um, incredibly stable. Um, could capture cells in them, measure enzymatic reactions. And uh, there's been many clever applications of this in the field of microfluidics, and this has become kind of a thriving subfield. And so I'll just wrap up with this and one more slide. Uh, you know, it's been just phenomenal to see this field of microfluidics go, again, from something that was very concerned with basic science, fluid physics in small dimensions, what happens with scaling, uh, to move to very practical devices. Uh, and there are a variety of technologies that are now commercially used, the valves, the emulsions, microfabricated well plates. A number of companies are using these in many different contexts. And new technologies are emerging on the horizon right now. Uh, here at IPVGG in the incubator, uh, there's a microfactory. Capsum also came out of here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think this is an area of real strength, uh, uh, both at ESPCI and in France. And you'll see, uh, I think, a number of exciting uh, commercial contributions here in the next few years. 
Um, so I'll close with this lovely quote from Pasteur. I, I usually show it in English. I managed to find the, the French translation last night. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, in the academic world, people often try to make this distinction between uh, what's pure and what's applied, and, and there's a sort of bias in some quarters to working on only very pure things. But many great minds like Pasteur found inspiration in the applied world, and I think it's, it's a lesson that remains true today. And, and it, it is, to my mind, very artificial to, to draw those boundaries, and we can maybe use that as, uh, as a discussion point later in the panel. Thank you. Question, Jason. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our second uh, speaker is Michael Tenter. Um, Michael Tenter is the director of the Wave Physics for Medicine unit at ESPCI. Uh, he's been deeply involved uh, in research on uh, ultrasound imaging including the time-reversed time acoustic waves for the treatment of cancerous brain tumor and analys analysis of organ softness. Uh, he's the recipient of many prestigious awards, including uh, the grand prize of the Fondation Energie and uh, French Academy of Science. Please welcome Michael Tenter. Thank, Thank you. you. So before having my slides, I would like first to, to thank uh, ESPCI and the City of Paris for this great event, really. And I would like to deeply thank uh, our, our guests because it's really a great pleasure for me and a great honor to present uh, just in front of you and, and show what we do in, uh, at the, this beautiful interface between physics and medicine. And I'm going to speak today about the, what I call the ultrasonic revolution, because in, you know, ultrasound in fact is born at ESPCI, thanks to, uh, uh, thanks to Pierre Curie, more than 100 years ago, he made the theory of piezoelectricity, electricity, and some years later, Paul Langevin made the first sonar experiment. So really, ultrasound is born here. And more than 100 years later, there is really a true revolution in ultrasound coming uh, at that time. And uh, I'm going to try to explain you why. But before going in that uh, things, I'm going to speak a little bit about two parameters in physics, two very important parameters, what is called time resolution and spatial resolution. And it's so important, these two parameters, that it defines our reality, uh, the way we see the world, in fact. We see the world with our eyes, it's our vision, and we see the world at 50 frames per second, typically. So it's enough to be able to walk in a crowded street without punching people. And it's the first uh, temporal resolution. And then if you try to see the smallest details you are able to see on, on a painting like this of, of Van Gogh, if you are quite young, it's okay. But if you are becoming quite older, the smallest details you are able to see are typically 0.5 millimeter. And these two parameters are our filters of reality. We see the world like this, and it's our, our way to, to understand the world. Now, of course, you know that if you want to see inside organs, it's not possible to use optics in order to go deep into organs because our body is completely opaque to, to, to light. And physicists have, have used a lot of different waves to do this, X-rays, electromagnetic waves. And ultrasound is very interesting because if you check these two parameters in ultrasound, in conventional applications, temporal resolution is 50 frames per second and, and spatial resolution 0.5 meters. So we see with ultrasound inside our body exactly the same way we see the world around us. It's the reason why we say to physicians, uh, ultrasound is real-time movie, real-time TV of your body, in fact. And in, it's this kind of resolution didn't change in the last 40 years because we acquire all this data, all this fetus you see here in the of, uh, successive decades, we acquired the, the images exactly the same way. We focus waves at one location and we acquire line per line. And it's true in all echographic devices in the world. And in fact, 20 years ago, uh, in fact, we broke this, this, this parameter. So we broke this fundamental limit of ultrasound. With my colleague Matthias Fink, we, we found a way to, to go from 50 frames per second to 10,000 frames per second. And we made the first ultra-fast echographic device in order to see at ultra-fast frame rate. Then, some years later, we found a way to go from 0.5 millimeter to, zero to 5 micrometers. So deep non-invasive microscopy using ultrasound, it's really coming now. 
So it's a complete revolution because the basics, the fundamentals of ultrasound are going to change today. And there is a last part coming from the two other ones, sensitivity to blood flow. We see big vessels with fast flows, but now with our system, we are able to go down to extremely small flow, extremely slow flow, one millimeter per second. And it makes that we will go to neuroscience. So the first part is how to break time resolution. And it's, uh, I told you, we are going to do completely different than conventional echographic devices, instead of focusing waves with ultrasound, what we do is we defocus wave. We do plane wave imaging or unfocused wave imaging. And it makes that we were able in 98 to, to build this first electronic device, an ugly machine. We were physicians we were working with so were saying it's a radiator, it's <laughs> an eating system. It was great because we were able to acquire 0.5 seconds at ultrafast format, 0.5 seconds of ultrafast movie. Bad thing was that it was we were able to acquire at ultrafast format, but it was taking one hour to process all the data. So people in the community were saying, oh, it's not an ultrafast system, it's an ultra slow system. But <laughs> after 20 years, of course, we improved a lot and we used, in fact, the more slow and the uh, computational power uh, exponential. And today we are able to do ultrafast imaging uh, without, without dead time. So 0.1 second, 0.1 second is enough, so going down from one hour to 0.1 second. And why we were working on this is because as soon as you go ultra fast, you see invisible things. Invisible things are things behind a wall, of course, where light cannot go, but it's also things going too fast. And as if you have a, an ultra fast camera like this, you are able to see new things. You are able to see, for example, here vibration in this symbol, and these mechanical waves give you access to the rigidity of the material. So if you go ultra fast, you enter into this millisecond range, and what is nice in medicine, is that almost all the important physics phenomenon occur in the millisecond range. If you want uh, to have access to these parameters, you have to go ultra fast. Here you have a friend at, uh, at the beach in, uh, in summer, you send a water balloon, you see, and you, you are going to create a seismic wave like this. And this wave exists, we don't see it with our own eyes, but this wave goes at some meters per second. And if you check the speed of this shear wave, you have access to stiffness. And it's really human body seismology, in fact. If you have muscle contractions, the electric contraction is going to, to propagate at some meters per second. Again, if you want to track it every millimeter, you have to go in the millisecond range. And finally, blood flow in big arteries, when you've got a stenosis, the jet is, is about one meter per second. So the, the three vital flow in our body, so mechanics, electric activity here, or contraction of muscles and blood flow, you have to go ultra fast to have access in real time to this. Okay. So the first application we wanted to do was to try to have access to stiffness because stiffness is measured by physicians for more than 3,000 years. It's the first act of medicine is palpation. When you palpate your body, you try to have access to stiffness, but of course it's, qu it's not quantitative, it's uh, intuitive. And if you have a good physician, he will do properly the exam. If you have a bad one, you will have difficulties to feel uh, everything. So we, we, we wanted to see these mechanical waves in our body in order to have access quantitatively to stiffness. And we did this kind of systems. It's an echographic device, but it's particular because we are going to create with ultrasound a remote palpation inside the body. We, we focus wave and we create a, an earthquake, a very small earthquake inside uh, the organ. And this earthquake is creating the shear wave, the mechanical wave you've seen. And then we do ultra fast imaging in order to have access to this. And if you do this and you calculate the displacement, you have this kind of movies. So it's really human body seismology. You see mechanical waves in, in, in your organs. Then you calculate the speed everywhere and you have access to stiffness. So if you're soft, st the shear wave speed is low. If you're fast, it's, uh, your organs are stiff. And you see here why it's interesting. You've got two lesions in the breast of patients at Institut Curie. One is a fibroadenoma, one is a, a cancer. You see, they look the same on the echographic image, but if you check the, the stiffness map, uh, the stiffness of the fibroadenoma, which is benign lesion, is the same as surrounding tissues, but, but the carcinoma is 20 times stiffer than surrounding tissues. So if you use this technology with, in addition to ultrasound, you increase the specificity of ultrasound imaging for breast cancer diagnosis by 25%, and it makes that you can decrease the number of biopsies in the world by a factor two. So it's really a huge amount of, of biopsies. Uh, there is a huge uh, amount of applications. With Matthias, we created a startup company in 2005 for this. Oh, sorry. And uh, there is already 2,000 systems in the world making every year uh, a lot of almost 1 million exams every year. 
Okay, and it, of course, because it's interesting for everything, because as soon as we go to pathology, architecture of tissues are changing and stiffness is changing. So breast cancer, liver cancer, arterial hygienity, like, uh, thyroid cancer, and musculoskeletic imaging, so you see, and tendon elasticity, a huge amount of application. So it was the first uh, try to, to make diagnosis in, in, in medicine, but in fact, it's interesting to do ultrafast imaging for other things and to try to see blood flow, for example. And here, what you see here is just my finger, in fact. If you do ultrafast imaging, what we call ultrafast Doppler, in fact, we understood that we can be extremely sensitive to very small blood flow. And with a the conventional echographic device, you don't see any blood flow. And here you see, in my finger, you see the vasculature, the blood flow in my dermis. And you even see uh, my, my uh, hairs here that are moving uh, in the jail. So it's extremely sensitive. And as we found that it was sensitive enough to see small vessels, we understood that we could use ultrasound now to go to neuroscience. Because in your brain, when neurons are working, in fact, the blood flow in small vessels is going to change. And we are going to see the activity of neurons through the neurovascular coupling. And it's what we did. You see here the vasculature of the brain of rats. Uh, just using ultrasound, so extremely sensitive. So you see all the vasculature of a rat. And now we are going to check how the blood flow is changing when you make a stimulus, a neuronal stimulus. And here you see examples. Uh, so you should see... Uh, I, don't, I don't see the movies. <laughs> um, that. Could I? Okay, I'm going to try to do this. Some okay, I try to find it here. I don't see my... I don't see it. Okay, uh, sorry. So here we vibrate the whiskers. I ah, know, he doesn't see it. Wow. So he, here what we do is we vibrate the whiskers of a rat and this this vibration is going to activate the barrel cortex, and we were able to see this vibration and this activation of neurons using ultrasound. Then we created epileptic seizures in the brain of rats, and just by, by injecting 4-AP in the brain, we were able to see the spatiotemporal dynamics of epileptic seizures with a resolution, and, and spatial resolution and temporal resolution, four times better than fMRI with a portable device. So it's a huge change for uh, applications in neuroscience because we, we can really do the same as fMRI with better resolutions in, in mice and rats uh, for pharma industry. Okay. Then we made the first proof of concept in clinics. So here you can see a baby uh, at Ro uh, Robert Debré Hospital in Paris. Uh, we began to do experiments just at bedside with a system, with an ultrafast echographic system. We put it on the, on the fontanelle here. And you see here it's conventional ultrasound. You see the blood flow in the brain. And if you use our systems, you see, we, you see a huge amount of vessels, all sm very small vessels. And just by, uh, by uh, recording the changes versus time, you are going to see that we have access to, I hope you will see that we have access to, to the epileptic seizures in babies, just at bedside. So here it's a baby that has uh, hemimegaencephaly. Unfortunately, he was drug resistant and he, he had a lot of epileptic seizures, and here you see for the first time a functional ultrasound movie in humans. So it's epileptic seizures. Here you see waves during the interactal events, and you are going to see that we have a vascular precursor. Uh, you are going to see an increase of blood flow in the cortex two minutes before the next epileptic seizures. Okay. You can see it, and we don't detect, oh, okay, and you see the next epileptic seizure. So it's more sensitive than clinical EEG systems. Okay, so as soon as you've got access to the brain activity in humans like this, you can try to begin to understand connectivity, functional connectivity of the brain, try to uh, find biomarkers for autism, for mental defects, for depression, and so on, uh, a lot of applications. Okay, because everything is in the brain, perception, attention, memory. And today there is a gap, there is systems, huge systems, extremely expensive systems with very beautiful images like MRI, F functional MRI, and you've got portable systems like EEG at the surface, but in fact the problem is that the image is only uh, the activity at the surface. You, have ac you don't have access to where is, is the signal inside. And in between, in fact, we begin to dream there is a place for ultrasound to do a portable system able to see extremely locally in the brain. So we could have access to regions of the brain, and we are sure that with this ultrasound we will be able in the future to control our pain 
just by showing the singular cortex with ultrasound with a portable device. Okay. So the second uh, resolution is uh, spatial resolution, how to try to do microscopy, with, with microscopy without opening the patient, which is a dream for everybody. And in fact, it's what we call ultrasound localization microscopy. As we are in Paris, uh, I wanted to show this slide. Every, every night at 7, 8 in Paris, you've got all these flashes on the Eiffel Tower. It's really great because you have a lot of flashes at the same time. And if you've got a camera, you are going to make an image which has the resolution of the conventional camera uh, of optics. <laughs> Now, if you've got an ultra-fast camera, and if you are extremely fast, you are going to be able to have access to one flash, then one flash, then one flash, and you will be able, to, on each image, to, to access to the halo, optical halo, and, and then taking the position of the center, you have the exact position of the lamp on the Eiffel Tower, and you are able to make a map of the uh, Eiffel Tower with a much better resolution than the conventional camera. And in fact, we can do exactly this in ultrasound in our body. We just have to inject gas bubble because ultrasound is reflected by extremely small gas bubbles. It's accepted by FDA regulation. It's a contrast agent. It's in clinics. You inject these bubbles, but now you do ultrafast imaging. And if you do this, you are going to detect here in the, ra in the rat brain 8 million bu of bubbles in some second, tens of seconds. And you see, you, you, you go to microscopic resolution, even deep into organs. So capillary resolution. And I can show you here the results. Here it's ultra-fast Doppler. It's 100 times sen more sensitive than conventional ultrasound Doppler. You, you see the vessels in the brain of this rat. And if I do super resolution with bubbles, you see, we go down to 5 micrometer resolution. So ultrasound is going to be the first modality able to see at the microscopic scale at several centimeters deep into organs. So you see, you can imagine we are going to see all vessels in tumors, we are going to see all the vessels in the brain just by injecting bubbles uh, to do diagnosis. And you see, you can even quantify the blood flow speed here. We do all these things in Paris, and Paris is great because you see here, ESPCI is just in the center of Paris, but what is great is that we have a huge network of clinical doctors working with us in all the hospitals, and we take always the best departments in each hospital. So we work with Pompidou for cardiac applications, with no for no so it's a great network of, of medical doctors and, and centers, and we try to create uh, medical imaging devices, uh, therapeutic devices, and smart sensors for e-health. So I uh, thank you very much, and I would like to, to, to end with this sentence. I, I love this sentence from C. Deb Brunner, Nobel Prize in Medicine 2002. Progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, but probably in that order. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
And if I show you a lot of pictures, well, I, I will find a neuron that is firing every time I show you a picture of Jennifer Aniston. Right. So this neuron will be active only if I present a Jeff picture of Jennifer Aniston. And it will be totally silent uh, for all of the pictures. So that's been be, be, be done uh, in Los Angeles. I can record another neuron. And wha wha what you can see is that you've got one neuron that will fire for a picture of Albury. Right. And this neuron is a little more inter interesting because this neuron is active when you sh see a picture of Albury but also when you see a picture of Catwoman, right, and you don't recognize Halberry in that picture, you just know that Halberry plays in that movie. And also firing when you present the name Halberry on the screen. So if I recall this neuron in the brain, I know if you're viewing a, a picture of Halberry or the concept of Halberry. That's the closest link we, we have so far between activity of neuron and eye concept in the brain, semantic concept uh, in the brain. But that's not real memory. So, in the same team uh, in Los Angeles, they did the exact same stuff with uh, neuron that is firing for Tom Cruise. So you and they show lots of different movies, and the neuron is firing for Tom Cruise, but not for Dennis or or not Schwarzenegger. And then they wait for one hour, and then ask the subject, "What kind of movie did you see?" And every time the subject was uh, saying, "I saw a movie." with Tom Cruise, the neuron was firing. So by recording the, the activity of this neuron, you know when you see Tom Cruise or when you think about Tom Cruise. Right. And the question you may ask is, is the brain that simple? And the answer is no, it's never that simple. You, you don't have one single neuron for one specific concept. And you can see that, for instance, you've got the Lucas Skywalker neuron. Everything is done in Los Angeles. Might be a reason for the selectivity of the neuron. Uh, when you talk, so you've got the Luke Skywalker neuron that is also firing for Yoda. Right. And so the, 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 the concept is if you record one neuron, you, you can't s test all the picture to be sure that this neuron is selective. So the, que the, the most likely hypothesis neuroscientists are to explain this process is that the, the brain is like nature, and nature do things quite smart in a smart way, and then you've got complex population coding in the brain. So you've got population of neurons that are active for Luke Skywalker, but among those neurons, you've got two neurons that are also active for Yoda. But if you look all those neurons, you will know whether you're thinking about viewing Luke Skywalker and not Yoda. But that's coding over a large population of neurons. So you can't test that really in human because in human you can record one neuron at a time and you, you can't do this kind of analysis. So, so we try to test those hypotheses in rodents because we can record lots of neurons in rodents. And in rodents you don't find neurons that are specific for geniston, but you do find neurons that are active according to your location in the physical world. And that's discovery that's been made by John O'Keefe, who, who, who got the Nobel Prize, that was a very long time ago. He, he, he recorded what he called plus cells. So you've got neurons and rodent brain that are firing when the animal is in particular location in the environment. And that's also true in human. It's been done in human as well. I've got neurons in my brain that are firing when I'm here, and neurons in my brain, other neurons that are firing when I'm there. And if I just look the activity of all the neurons, I know exactly in real time where I am in this environment. So that's a movie that has been done uh, um, uh, at the PCI. So that's classical maze we use in rodents. So you can go on the left to get reward, or on the right and uh, move. The red cross is the true position of the animal. And the blue dot and the green dot are, is the position we compute just by looking at cell activity. So we record neural activity and we say, okay, Based on this activity, I think the animal is here. And that's moving in real time. So you see that the animal is moving, and you don't have to look at the video camera. You just have to look at the neuronal activity in the brain to know exactly where the animal is. And that's very interesting, because you don't decode what the animal is doing. You decode what it's thinking. And that's the big question, is if I'm here, and this place cell is active, am I thinking about that position? And that's the question we have. Sometimes, you, you, you might have said in the video, sometimes the animal is here, but what you decode is this trajectory. And the question is, 
is the animal here actually thinking about what I will do? And the question is whether you code the future the same way you code the past. So you use your memory to create a simulation of your future and to evaluate the consequence of your future action. And that's the question we asked. So the first answer is whether the animal will do this trajectory. And that's indeed the case. But that's not real proof. The proof will be, just like for the Tom Cruise neuron, you will stop the experiment and you ask the rat, are you thinking about that trajectory? Or are you thinking to that uh, position? But unfortunately, rats don't talk. But you can de decode that and try to, to test uh, this hypothesis. And to do so, uh, I will show you that looking at what's going on in your brain during sleep can help you to ask questions to rodent. And it has been shown many years ago that if you put a rat in a linear track, you will have neurons that firing according to the position, for instance, this plus cell. If the animal is always doing the same trajectory, you will have this plus cell active, then this plus cell, then this one, and this one. Always the same sequence. And if you make the animal sleep just after the task, you see that the same neurons are reactivated in the same order. And the hypothesis that have been done since this discovery uh, um, by uh, my, Matt Wilson and Bryce McNaughton is that those reactivation during sleep is just acting just like repetition for classical learning. So the hypothesis is that you encode information during wake and your brain got a device to replace this activity during sleep and replaying act just like repetition for classical learning. But that's consistent with this theory, but you've got to test it. So a couple of years ago, we, we tested directly by looking at brain activity during sleep, detecting those reactivation and suppressing it. And when you suppress activity so you don't affect learning during awake, you just make the animal learn, and then during the sleep after the task, you suppress the activation. And then you see that the learning is decreasing. So when you learn something, uh, if you, the fact that you reactivate those activity just after during sleep helps you to consolidate your memory. But that's not technical proof of, of what's go going on because basically what we do is, is to, to try to understand those mechanisms is we make a very simple we, we, we put a reward here during awake and we create a memory about an association between this location and a reward. And this creates a memory that is labile, or it's fragile. And you need sleep to consolidate and to have stabilized memory. And to really test the hypothesis, the, you always have in science to test whether it's necessary and it's sufficient. So to really demonstrate during sleep when those, ne those neurons are active, it's really a reactivation of spatial experience. We try to do the opposite. We try to use the reactivation during sleep to create a fake memory during sleep and a fake place reward association during sleep. So the idea is to give reward during sleep. So you can't give um, cheese the, during sleep, but your brain is just electrical activity. And every time you get a reward, you've got dopaminergic neurons that are, uh, that are active. So if you stick an electrode in the dopaminergic neuron in your brain, you can give reward. And you can do that in sleep because it does not wake up the animal. So I imagine you got a rat, you put it in a box, and you give reward every time the animal is here in that box. The animal will learn to associate this location to reward and spend all this time here. So the idea is not giving reward uh, in function of the position of the animal, but based on the activity of a plus cell. So when the animal is here, the plus cell is active. If I detect in real time the activity of this neuron, by brain-computer interface, I can trigger a rewarding stimulation based on this activity. And it will give all the reward at the same location. So I have the exact same place performed task. But I don't need to look at where the animal is. I just have to look at brain activity. So I can do that during sleep. So I use this place cell, for instance. And every time when the animal is sleeping, every time this neuron is active, so the idea is that the animal is dreaming about that position then I will give a reward to the animal when he's dreaming about the position. And the question is whether after waking up, the animal will go there. So that's the experiment we did. Uh, so we put a, 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 a rat a, in, a, in a box, and we use this plus cell, for instance, that is firing when the animal is at the top of the environment. So before the animal goes everywhere, so it's 
quantification of exploration is quite dark because it goes everywhere. And then during one hour of sleep, every time of this neuron is firing, we trigger a rewarding stimulation. So we give rewards. So we give a, a cheese when the animal is here. The thing is dreaming is here. And then we wake up the animal. We put back the animal in the environment. And as you see, the animal goes directly in the place field. So we were able to create during sleep an association between the place and the reward. And that's very important uh, at the fundamental level because what we did at during sleep, we made an association between the activity of a neuron and a reward. But what we have created after waking up is an association between a location in the physical world and a reward. So that the first time we, we, we saw in Rodent that we can substitute the explicit exploration of the physical world by the activity of neuron. And so basically what we did here is we simply asked for a Rodent, did you sleep about Tom Cruise? So that's very important at the fundamental point of view because it, it explains that R can work in one that not just based on what they do, but based on what they think. And I can w see how animals simulate their trajectory in an environment to, to, to find a way and to estimate the, consequence, the future consequences of their action. Because the same network are involved to consolidate your memory and to simulate trajectory to find your, 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 your future. So that's what we, we, we try to do. It, 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 we try to recall lots of neurons to understand how brain networks and neuronal networks work. And it's very informative for fundamental research, or, or, or I see, but it's also a, extremely efficient because you've got lots of new machine learning and artificial learning, which are mostly related to artificial neural network. And the idea is to, so basic, Machine learning and artificial network are always the same. So you've got different layers of neurons that are coming together, and you've got inputs that can be a video, that can be anything, and you've got output because you want to make classification, right? And you probably heard about the name deep learning. That's exactly the same principle, but you just have more layers, and that's a big problem because it's known for decades the principle, but so far we don't find the rule to change the weight between the neuron to make the learning learn. The, the network learned. And that's what we, we try to do is, for instance, the place cell are formed when you put the animal in a new environment in a few minutes, any kind of environment, how complex it is. And that's very interesting because it learns faster than any different system or different machine learning developed so far. So that's quite uh, interesting. Th and that's the kind of question we, we, we have at the SPCI. And to, 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 to mix people working in the field of physics, in the field of machine learning and big data, and in neuroscience, and especially in the brain plasticity unit, because we specifically ask the question about how the weight in a normal brain, how the brain, the weight of the communication between you know, have changed so the animal learn because the brain is better than any machine learning developed so far. And we, we work on mice, we work on human, we work on also in fly, in men saying, why do you work in, uh, in fly? And actually, I, I, it is because, for instance, in the last science paper, which is quite, uh, um, they, they found that by taking uh, intel about how fly brain works, they were able to develop new algorithms that uh, are better that classical uh, neural network the, the, the as well. So understanding how brain networks in living animal, even in fly, works, make you improve all the artificial networks that are used uh, in, in uh, modern society. So understanding how a real net neural network uh, works make you develop more efficient or artificial learning. And so that's the kind of stuff we're, we're doing in trying to work with people uh, working in machine learning, both to improve machine learning, but we also use a lot of machine learning tools to better understand the brain. Um, the other application of uh, our experiment uh, is uh, whether we can try to use our brain-computer interface to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. So the idea is, so we, we, we put a rat a, in a U-shaped maze and we, we make uh, aversive stimulation during wakefulness. So we make an aversive learning during wake for a particular location. So the animal will avoid this location. And then during sleep, we use this blood cell to put 
positive stimulation and to, to try to, to reverse this activity. Now that can be extremely useful because it will be a painless treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder because so far what we do is you ask two people suffering for those traumatic events to think about that in doctor uh, office or so on. So that's quite painful. And the problem is it's difficult to reverse the negative association because the, animal, the subject knows that they are in the doctor's office and not in the real traumatic experience. And worse, the brain knows. And if the brain knows, then there is a difference between the real life and thinking about the real life. And the advantage is that during sleep, it's real for the brain. So when you dream, it's, free, it's real. It's just when you wake up that you realize that it's not, not real reality. And we can change the weight of, of synapse more efficiently if you reactivate the true traumatic experience. So that's the, the, the hypothesis. Of course, that's proof of concept in, in one end, but the idea is here. So the only thing you, you will need only is to, to try to detect in human brain whether you think about traumatic experience uh, du during sleep. And actually, it, uh, it has been done, again, with machine learning, with fMRI. So if you, you put a subject in, in fMRI and then you present a lot of different movies, it has been done in Berkeley, uh, and you present a lot of different movies, you've got machine learning try to make a link between the movie you're presenting and the activity in your brain. And then you do that for five hours. And then you present a clip, uh, a video clip that the subject never seen. And you try to reconstruct the image the subject is seeing just based on fMRI activity. And that's what you see. That's the presented clip. And that's the image you, you reconstruct just based on brain activity. And that's it. So you see, every time you've got a subject, you can pretty much reconstruct what you are actually seeing. So that is done during wakefulness, but people are trying to, to do that during sleep. So you can pretty much decode, and that's interesting because that's you want to decode something you don't know. But if you want to decode a traumatic experience, you know exactly what you're looking for, so it's most likely it, it will be much more easy to decode something unknown. The other stuff is you, you, you would like to make simulation in deep structures, and that's the most problematic problem so, uh, so far. So we're working with uh, Michael Tante with acoustic waves because you can go in very deep structures uh, where the positive or negative valence is encoded in the brain. Of course, we, we need to do the thing because you want to know exactly how positive valence and negative valence compete in your brain. You, if you are scared by, uh, by spider, you don't want to like spider in your dream that makes you scared uh, during wakefulness. So that's something that I I is going on. And our, uh, that's the kind of stuff we're, we're, we're working on uh, at this PCI. And I want to, to thank my, my student who did the experiment and the founder. And I really want to thank the, the, the city of Paris because this project, when I started this project, people said, so, uh, it's smart, it's clever, right? Well, okay, honestly, what are you working on? Because it won't ever work. And this project has been done by the program Emergence of, of, of Paris. And that's really important because given the, the problem of funding for fundamental research when it's a little bit crazy like that, it's really important to have the support uh, of the city of Paris. So I really wanted to do thank you. So I hope you will enjoy your, your stay in Paris. And if you've got a problem, and come into my lab, I have a little nap, and I will try to fix it. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to welcome Jérôme Bibet. Uh, Jérôme Bibet is the director of uh, the Chemistry Biology Innovation Research Unit at ESPCI. His area of expertise uh, include the study and synthesis of colloids and emulsions. Uh, his researches have led to many pharmaceutical, cosmetics and medical applications and he's also launched several companies in the area of biotechnologies including Adamtech, Rendance Technologies and Capsum. Please welcome Jérôme Bibet. Thank you very much. Before starting, my pleasure is to thank, of course, the organizer and uh, Jean-Baptiste is his in his team, so you can relax. Everything is work fine. And uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, our guest. It's an occasion for us to give a talk with a full amphitheater. It's not very often, so thank you also. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, I'd like to thank the city of Paris. Jean-Louis is there, so for that reason, we are still 
located in the center of Paris and we have the charm of the place and also the opportunity to have all these visitors. Steve was talking about that before, but uh, we have many visitors coming very often, so sharing and boosting our, our science. So uh, today I'm going to talk about something that we recently start. It's, uh, it's not a long adventure that I'm going to summarize. It's something that have emerged in our mind a few, I would say a few years ago. And now it starts to be ripe, so I can talk about it. So it's uh, advancing material. I will take your... Uh, I help you to stretch a bit your, your brain to try to understand, to figure out some new concept of material. It's going to be something to conceptualize because it changed from the idea we have of something that's surrounding us. Okay, so the, the thing I start with is an inspiration from nature. I decided to take the example of fecundation and germination of seed plants. So the seed plants come from about 300 million of years in the Carboniciferous period. So it's a strategy that nature did invent to make the germination and the reproduction and germination afterward. So how does it work? Basically, each species is producing these cells that are called pollen cells, so maybe universal, they are here, represented here. Each species has a pollen cell which is different and the strategy for making the reproduction is to create an enormous amount of this object and to just spread them into the atmosphere with a little chance that some of them hit their target, create fecundation. That's the strategy that was adopted by nature some hundred million of years ago. Then there is uh, the step of germination where once the fertilization is done, then the seed fly again, there is much less seed fertilized than pollen cell of course, fly again and cover space again, fall down, just random, and the one that finds the right condition built up a tree or a plant. Okay, so we see that it's absolutely based on random process without any help of facilitated motion or directed motion as it arose a few 50 million years after when the flowers and fruit was helping with the help of animal and insect to direct and facilitate motion, allowing to produce much less of these objects. Okay, so I don't want to be uh, very, very uh, ambitious. I just want to stick on the strategy of nature at that period. And the idea now is to think about, since it works, randomly we are able to create a big solution with a big programmable step. We should be able to think about something uh, similar. Okay, so the conclusion is it works. Nature is able to do it, so we should think about, about something similar. So I uh, let me allow you to imagine something different. Uh, surrounding materials that are everywhere, suppose now they are infested. I would take some wording that help everybody to understand. Suppose this material all over the place are infested with little objects the same way as pollen cells are infested in the atmosphere, such that at some point they will offer to material an ability to create locally a highly beneficial solution. So instead of just sticking on bulk surface property of the matter everywhere, we should think about the ability of this matter inside to deliver some new programmable property. That would change the scope of materials that we are used to, right? Okay, so this is something I want now to explain a bit further. How this could be useful? Think a minute. So if you think about uh, solid material, this will cover anything related to coating, any metals, you see. Any metal is coated for tanks, for boats, for anything you see, construction. There is a lot of coating material all over the place. But it could be, it could be also for any type of uh, material like furniture, commodity product that will bring some novel property. It will work also for liquids. We can think of liquids which are also blended with this type of object and by coating they could uh, be left on surface and develop new programmable solutions. So this is, has almost no limit in our mind. The question is how can we match the ability of nature with our own ability. So what are the requirements? They are pretty, pretty limited but uh, as long as we are not really facing the reality of science, the requirements is quite easy. So are pollen cell-likes, 
are the objects I, I am planning to, to, to develop and to show you. So this object might be very small, of course. Why should they be small? Because if they are small, the mass is limited and the number will be very high, so we have a chance to really cover the matter entirely, such the resolution distance for the response to apply will be very small. Otherwise, we have a response there, but you don't have the, the same one here, so that's not what we want. In addition, we have to respect something which is far from being obvious. This object, this pollen cell, should have no leak whatsoever, because at the end, this object should contain something which is supposed to precisely act at some places. So if over time there is some leaks, we are going to lose the solution. And uh, the very uh, last uh, criteria, which is not the easiest, this object should be uh, able to, to respond to something. So the stuff we are thinking of, obviously, something related to any local stress deformation, teeny things, insignificant teeny things should be uh, detected, some crack, uh, damages due to, uh, to a radiation, chemical change, locally, that could develop some nasty program on the material, etc., etc. That may work, I suppose, yes. So let's take two examples. And uh, they are very important in material science. So it's about arresting every process of nucleation and propagation. So why is a, is a material damaged? So let me take an example. A material starts to be damaged for mainly two reasons. First of all, it's the chemical damage. So basically, we can think about rust, corrosion. Or it's the mechanical damage where there is a crack and the crack, if the matter is under tension, the crack propagates. So if with this basic idea we are able to solve and to inhibit these two aspects, nucleation and or propagation, we are adding to material an enormous advantage. So, about nucleation of corrosion. So how corrosion occurs on these big metal pieces on tank, boat, or so on? Basically, there is a little break on the coating, and when there is enough of a break, there is permeation of some water plus oxygen, and there is nucleation. Once nucleation is there, for the people who know, it propagates. You have to stop nucleation. These ideas could stop, because locally you find a programmable object able to develop a counteraction, delivering something which is going to stop at the nucleation stage. And the same for the propagation of crack. When the crack is done, suppose this matter is under tension, you will have nucleation of crack very often. When they are done, they will be annealed right away in place in time. This is the scope, okay? So we have two examples, so we can move on a bit. So how do we do this? So there is a version 1.0, the first thing we come up with, based, of course, on our background of science and technology for years. And we did create what I call plastic container, few micron size with core class system. So the way to make your understanding is to take that bottle, exactly that bottle, and suppose you reduce the size down to few micron. So you reduce the wall to 100 nanometer, and you built up a cork, which is also attached to the container, of the same size, micron size but you respect the fact that you are using real plastics. All the innovation I'm bringing is to make colloidal science with real plastic of any sort. This is the key to make objects that are sustained the criteria. So we have to build also this uh, cork-like system and make such we can set the thickness of the wall and the cork nature, and then we are in business to be sensing many type of parameters that act on material. All right, so is science meeting our goal? So I would say it's the beginning of the story. But we have had at least a sort of proof of principle here. What do you see? This is a plastic container. It's done of polymerizable, pure monomer. Could be a single monomer or a mixture of monomer, but there is absolutely no solvent there, so you create a dense ma plastic material with a pore size which is about angstrom or a few angstrom, which means that there is absolutely no leak. 
Then you see that we are able to insert into this thread would be sensitive to something outside that would swell and disrupt the shell. This is the cork principle. If you are able to invent different routes for cork, different routes for making different materials on different compartments inside, then we have the recipe to build our dream. So is there something else to tell? Yes. Uh, the, the idea of using this plastic material, in fact, was, of course, we need to have a, a real encapsulation, no leaks, so we had to take this plastic. But the good, uh, the good news about them is the following. If you template them at a scale of 100 nanometer here thickness, they behave in a very controlled manner, such you are you are able to tear them always with the same force, always with the same shear. So that means that you can control the structure related to the use. And this is only possible at that scale. OK, so is technology now ripe? This is a question that we address, of course. I would say almost, because why? We have already solved the issue of the scale-up. The method I'm presenting can be scale up to immense volume, 1,000 tons easily. So this is matching the use that we have in mind, which is invading material science with this type of object. That way of doing fit with this expectation. And there is another thing which is far from being not important. This is uh, this word, biodegradable. So you know that today, if you want to improve technology, you have also to bring materials that degrade. And the beauty of the technology is that you, you can use any type of plastics, but in addition, the one which are developed today, which are totally biodegradable and biosourced. So I think we open a game today in uh, material science that could go far beyond that and really produce some real change in material science and is the manufacturing of material. Bringing property that are matching with higher performance and much safer for the reason I was explaining. So just to finish, what is the future of it? We have the point zero version and then we are going to develop program to make the point one, point two and so on. But the point one is for sure developing the cork that is going to sense ligands in the system on a surface or in bulk. So to have a method to open upon specific recognition. This, of course, will create a boulevard to biotech and medicine and so on. So I think I give you the flavor. It's recent. I choose to tell you that story because I thought it was just entertaining and I hope it was. And uh, Jamie is going to talk later about the first version of the valorization of it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to the speakers for those great presentations. Now we're going to hear for f from uh, four young and uh, talented people who are going to speak about the innovative startup they've created in the leading scientific fields. So first of all, uh, I'd like to welcome Jamie Walters. He's the CEO of Calixia, a designer and manufacturer of microcapsules for industrial use, but I'm sure he'll explain to you much better than I can. Please welcome Jamie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to start this presentation with a very simple and very quick hands-up survey. So who in the audience today is worried about the safety and the environmental impact of the products that you're surrounded with in and around your home? It's clear. Second question. Who would like to use products in and around your home that are both safe for your health and safe for the environment? One final question. Who would like these same safe products also have a performance far greater than any of the products on the market today? As I say, this combination of safe and high performance products is a target for everybody. It's a target for producers of the products, it's a target for the regulators, and it's also a target for the end consumers. The problem is, this combination of safe and high performance products cannot be achieved. And I'd like to share why. Each of these products contains active ingredients. 
These are what provides the performance of the product. And active ingredients, they inherently degrade, they oxidize, they hydrolyze, they decompose, they cross-react with other ingredients, and they react too early, both in the production and in the storage and in the end use. And so the producers of these products have only two options in order to create products with a performance that's acceptable. Option one is they use harmful ingredients that degrade less, which damages the health of all of us around. Option two, they increase the amount of active ingredients by up to 10 times to compensate for the loss, which increases the environmental impact associated with production and with the waste associated. So as I share, it cannot be done. It can't be done. Now fortunately, for everybody here in this room and around the world, this is a viewpoint of the past. And today, I'd like to share a completely new vision. A vision where products can be safe for your health, where they can be safe for the environment, and where they can have a performance that shatters the current ceiling in performance of products today. <laughs> to, to achieve this, we assembled a team of serial entrepreneurs, of world-leading scientists from here at the SPCI, Harvard and Cambridge, and we brought in management, executive management from the chemical industry to create a new type of chemical company, a chemical company with a heart. And our objective and what we do today is we work with the world's largest producers of all these products, top five, top ten companies in the world, to transform their products to become safe for our health, environmentally sustainable, and have a performance that we typically expect in decades. And so without further delay, it is a great honor a great pleasure for me to present to you Calixia. As shared by Jerome, inspired by nature, we have invented the world's first perfectly sealed, no leakage, no containment, all containment, uh, biodegradable microcapsule technology. And this microcapsule technology provides a protective coating, a protective shield around the active ingredients in all these products thus eliminating the degradation of this active ingredient. What's more, these capsules are sensitive. They detect tiny local uh, changes in the physical and chemical space to activate the delivery of the active ingredient at the optimum performance window. And the benefits of this are massive. For the producers of all these products, by replacing current active ingredients by protected active ingredients, you can reduce the amount of active ingredients in products by up to 10 times, which significantly decreases the environmental impact of the product. By blending protected active ingredients into their products, a whole library of new, safe, natural active ingredients that were previously too sensitive for degradation can now be formulated, enabling us to eliminate harmful ingredients to, and our exposure to them. And what's more, as Jerome shared, by this sensitive system that is able to deliver at the right time, a whole series of advanced new products become accessible. Uh, for example, uh, in your garden, you apply a product that the moment a caterpillar or a butterfly or a moth comes to eat the vegetation, it detects uh, its presence and delivers a safe and natural repellent. On your car, the moment corrosion is about to occur, the capsules detect the tiny and local insignificant chemical change and deliver an anti-corrosive. In your bathroom on the paints on your wall, when the pH and humidity is ripe for biofilm formation and mold uh, production, the capsules release an antimicrobial. Uh, another, another example, a final example, your mobile phone, the moment you drop it on your floor, the capsules detect the mechanical change, deliver a self-healing polymer, making your phone crack-proof. So how far are we from achieving this high-performance world? Well, as of uh, this year, we've just moved in to a brand new R&D and large-scale industrial uh, production facility where by the end of this year, we'll be looking to produce uh, hundreds of tons of an encapsulated active ingredients. But this is just the very beginning. The impact of this technology and the appetite for this technology is massive. And so we have a very ambitious strategy over the next coming years to increase our production capacity far beyond these levels. So that from 2019, as requested by our clients, our clients can launch a whole new generation of advanced products that are beneficial for your health, that are safe for the environment, 
and have a performance that shatters the current This is Calexia and how we go beyond chemistry and our solution to try and impact the world. I'd like to thank the SPCI for hosting us during our incubation and for Marie de Paris, Ile de France and BMP France for supporting us during our growth. And I'd like to thank you all here today for your attention. Okay, now we're going to listen to Thomas Ibert, CEO of DNA Script, uh, manufacturer of synthetic DNA. Please welcome Thomas Ibert. Thank you. This is the DNA molecule composed of A, T, C, and Gs, the four letters of the gen genetic alphabet, also called nucleotides. DNA is the support of all living form heredity. It contained the information from where you are, where you come from, who you are, and why you have such disease when you have some. Every, everybody is involved with DNA. Personally, I've been involved deeply with DNA as a scientist when I was trying to develop biofuels, one of the many applications of synthetic DNA. Amongst development of new drugs, new materials, and even someday development of the support for storing data, for example. So every life science project needs to have access to synthetic DNA to program biological systems. We need to make DNA. We need to be able to fabricate DNA. In another word, to synthesize DNA. The story behind DNA synthesis began in the 50s by the, by the discovery of the DNA structure, how it was complex and how it played a central role in life. Just after, scientists and researchers start to try to synthesize DNA by using organic chemistry. They managed to have success and to synthesize very short fragments of DNA, and that's led to the uh, cracking of the genetic code. But it was still very artisanal and very limited. It changed in the 80s when an American team introduced a phosphoramidate reagent, still an organic chemical reagent that helped make the DNA synthesis enter into an industrial era. So with those chemicals, the, a lot of researchers in life science make great discoveries, bring the biotech field to what we have, what we have today, and, and do a lot of different useful applications. But still, it's very limited in its performances. For the past 40 years, we are still using exactly the same chemical and the same process than which has been introduced in 83. No changes. And it has a great impact into how powerful we can produce DNA, especially in terms of speed of synthesis, quality of the DNA that is synthesized, and cost of the synthesis. What we do at DNA Script is we re replace those chemicals and the chemical process by an enzyme. An enzyme called a polymerase that is naturally occurring into every live cell. So those polymerase have evolved during billions of years to, be, to perform DNA synthesis. They are known to be the best catalyst for polymerasing DNA. At DNA Script, we are the first team to deeply engineer those polymerase in order to capture their full efficiency and their full performance. In the nature of those, those polymerase, they are only copying DNA. What we have done is we have studied the structure and changed it in order for the polymerase to be able to do de novo synthesis of DNA without copying any template strand. We also have developed a specific process where we put this polymerase 
in addition with some specific nucleotide in order to build DNA molecule without is using any solvent in simple aqueous media. In one word, what, what we have done is we have developed the perfect nano tool and the process that goes with it to perform, to create the link between the incoming nucleotide and the growing chain of DNA. So what you just see in this screen. This process, along with the engineering polymerase from GeneScript, has the potential to greatly improve the performances for DNA synthesis, especially for speed, quality and cost. What we want to do, in addition to that, is to bring this polymerase into a very simple to use box and create the first enzymatic DNA printer. This idea, we had this idea by ourselves, I, I told you um, uh, later, by ourselves using a lot of DNA into a synthetic biology project. We know that it was really tedious and not very performant. So we had this idea and we bring it to Institut Pasteur, we start a collaboration with them and we start the first experiment. From this first experiment, we bring the technology to a proof of concept where we, after one year, we were able to synthesize a codon. So, um, um, a basic word, in fact, in, in, in the genetic code. After a little bit more work on the process and on the engineering of the polymerase, we were able to synthesize a whole fragment of DNA with commercial relevance. And from that point, it attracts the interest of the uh, industrial leader of the genetic field, such as Illumina and Merck. Now that we are well funded, we are continuously improving the performances of the process and the polymerase. We are automating the process and we are working on the DNA printer concept. And the goal is to completely beat the chemistry in terms of performances. And what I can tell you is that we are already there, already better than chemistry, for quality and speed of synthesis. As I told you before, synthetic DNA is needed for every life science project. And today, for those projects, having access to synthetic DNA is limiting. We are developing our technology at DNAscript to remove that limit. We think that it will have a major impact into many applications such as developing new drugs for challenging in healthcare, for developing better food, for developing new materials or new energies with uh, um, great performances and sustainable performances too, and even bring some new innovation into areas like data storage or nanotechnology. For us, biology, biology is the next industrial revolution and we are coding it. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to present DNA script. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will welcome uh, Ludovic Lecointre, who is the CEO of Iconius, a uh, developer of a new type of neurofunctional imaging. Thank you. Okay. I was told to stay on the crux, so. <laughs> Okay, I would like to start with a, with a number, a very big one, 800 billion a year. Do you know what this is about? Have you an idea? No. I guess not, but you should know, because this is something we spend all together every year because of a part, a very important part of ourselves, our brain. It costs a lot to us because of its disease and its disabilities. In fact, if you don't know, it's the first expense in, in health in Europe and in other countries too. And the question is why, in fact, it's, and the answer is incredible. This is just a matter of tools. We don't have the appropriate tools about the brain. And let's go that into that in detail. Um, we don't have the appropriate tools in research to understand how it works, how the connections are built in the brain or broken in case of disease. We don't have the appropriate tools in the pharmaceutical industry to screen compound to find new drugs and efficient drugs. 
And in some instances, we don't have the appropriate tools in clinics to make early diagnostic, because we make diagnostic today when the clinical signs are visible, which is generally too late. And in fact, these unmet needs in one hand in research and in the other hand in clinics are the reason why we have decided to create ICONIS. And ICONIS is dedicated to neurosciences, and I would like to show this to you. In fact, we are talking about tools. Today, let's take the example of a scientist, a scientist who wants to study uh, how the, the brain of a mouse works. Uh, well, he has only one tool, MRI. And the problem is that he, before putting the animal in the MRI, he has to anesthetize it and to bond it, and then he can start to work. So he is going to study the, the brain, but what kind of study can he do? He's studying the brain of an animal who is sleeping and he cannot interact with it because it's, it's, in, it's enclosed in the system. So in fact, it's very frustrating, very limiting. Second point, uh, in fact, about the MRI, the, the, the anesthesia, which ma can make a bias in the results. And third point, uh, MRI is a very nice device for a lot of things, but in that case, for functional imaging, it's not very good, it's too slow. It makes one image every two or three seconds, whereas the, the, the biological events you want to see are in the range of a second, so you'll lose half or a third of the information. And look at this picture here, 100 micron is the best resolution they can match. Keep this in mind in a few seconds, please. And last but not least, this is a very, very expensive tool. In fact, scientists have a, have a dream. Uh, what they would like to do, they would like to have a small MRI that would fit on the head of the mouth. And this is absolutely impossible, of course. Well, but actually, that's what we do at Iconis. We, we put a small probe ultrasound probe on the head, and here comes the breakthrough. Look at that. The animal is awake, he is moving, he lives his life, and in the meantime, in real time, the scientist can watch what goes on in his, in his head. It changed completely the paradigm in neurosciences, because the scientist can put the, the, the subject in real situation where the brain works, and this is the best way to study the brain at work, isn't it? You can even study social interactions, and as the animal is at your hand, you can administrate a drug and see in real time the impact of that drug on the brain. And I'm making a parenthesis here. This is a video Michael could not show you. This is an epileptic seizure. Uh, it was published uh, in uh, Nature Method. It was the first time it was visible because, by, by definition, epileptic crisis seizure is an unpredictable event, non reproducible event, so you cannot capture that with MRI at all. End of the parenthesis. Uh, so, in fact, we, we are very fast, as Michael said. We can make a lot of images, so we don't lose anything. And uh, the resolution we, may, we can reach, as Michael said, is 5 micron, and compa as compared to the 100 micron of the MRI, you got an idea of the precision we can have. And in fact, this is, this is the, the proposal of Iconeos to the world of neurosciences, is to open the door to new kind of research, which means new findings. And new findings is what our customer want to have and this is also what we want to have as people, because we all have a brain that might be sometime, one day, sick. Fingers crossed. Uh, okay, so this is a, bit of a, a little bit of our business now. We sell equipment. We sell a um, piece of electronics. It comes together with some connection devices that will make the link between the electronics and the subject you want to study, whoever the subject is, an animal or a human. And we have a lot of software depending on the needs of the, the, the customer. And the can believe me, there is a lot of IP in these two things that comes from the SPCI. And we sell that 300 kilo euros. And I'm very proud to say that for our first year of existence, we have already sold two systems to very big names of the pharmaceutical industry. Just to have a, to give an idea of the, the added value we bring to our customers, if you would run an experiment one full day with MRI, you would pour from 12 animals within the day, and that would cost you more than 3,000 euros. And if you would perform the same experiment with the Iconos solution, it would be done within a half day and cost you less than 100 euros. Uh, and well, well, to make it simple, you have just to keep in mind that the Iconis solution, sorry, it was too fast, is easier, faster, cheaper than the gold reference to of today. So now, uh, yes, we make this technology available to research. So these people, pharmaceutical industry, CROs, academics, startup, they want to maybe study on uh, uh, Alzheimer, uh, autism, or schizophrenia, and they would want to understand these pathologies, they want to find treatment, they want to find ways to diagnose them earlier in clinics. Maybe some people may work on don't know, uh, artificial retina for blind people. These guys would like to know how it connects to the brain, that sends the right message to the brain at the right place, for instance. This type of thing that, that people will do, would be happy to do with our solution. 
We also will make this technology available later for human, uh, first in, in babies in, in, uh, and later in neurosurgery and down the road later again uh, for everybody uh, to make diagnosis and uh, treatment for it, for instance. And actually, uh, uh, Iconis wants to become a key player uh, to understand finally the brain, and we want to reduce the impact of disease and disabilities of the brain on life of patients and their family, because sometimes it's very heavy, and we would be very happy also to, de to, to decrease the cost of this disease uh, in public health. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. And uh, our next and last speaker for this part of the conference is Nushin Dayanat. She's the CEO of Cyprio, uh, manufacturer of liver and pancreas tissues for pharmaceutical and therapeutic use. Thank you and welcome, Nushin. Thank you. I start with a question. Do you have any idea how many tasks your liver is executing right now that you're sitting in your chairs? One, three, five. Actually, it executes 12 known functions, and there are still others that we discover. So actually, compared to other unifunctional organs that we have in our body, such as kidney or the heart, the liver is actually a multifunctional factory that is executing plenty of tasks in simultaneously. Blood uh, uh, bile secretion, it's the center of metabolism in our body. It synthesizes the cholesterol, the good one. <laughs> it filters the toxins. It fights infections and plenty other tasks. So actually, it's uh, a key organ that is maintaining the homeostasis, the equilibrium in our body and between different organs. So when we say a key organ, it means that in the case of failure, the uh, uh, consequence will be also dramatic. Now uh, let's think about the palliative treatments in the case of failure for these mentioned organs. For the kidney failure, we have the dialysis machine that can filter the blood of the patient. For the cardiac patients, we have these uh, uh, pacemaker implants that can help them control the heart rhythm. And in the case of liver failure, do you think there exists any commercialized palliative device that can fulfill all these 12 uh, functions for the uh, liver failure patients? The answer is no. So in Ciprio, we believe that the desirable palliative treatment to support the liver function in patients with acute and chronic liver failure is actually an extracorporeal bio-artificial liver device that uses the human liver cells, the cells that are programmed to do so. And that's how, in Jerome's lab, we have developed a novel technology that we named it BioPur to culture mammalian cells in the liquid core of micrometric capsules of alginate. So in the case of liver, we have encapsulated human hepatocytes, the liver cells that we have isolated from cadaveric liver, with this technology, and we kept the cell in culture during one week. And what is fantastic is that actually these cells are capable to create a spheroid, a miniaturized micro liver inside these capsules. And what is still more interesting is that when we study profoundly these uh, micro livers that we have named them hepatopers, we see that actually they uh, not only mimic the liver function the metabolism, detoxification, by secretion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also they mimic the 3D architecture that we detect in the liver. For instance, the biliary canaliculis that are present in our liver, we can detect them also in these hepatopers. So actually, these hepatopers are micrometric pieces of puzzle 
of our liver that are miniaturized in these capsules. Today, the hepatitis are used We don't want to stop there. So this is the number of liver transplantations performed in 2015, according to the Global Observatory of Donation and Transplantation. And if we look at the number of liver transplantations performed in France in the same year, you can see that there have been 1,355 patients who could receive a liver transplant. But on the other hand, we have approximately the same number of patients that have been on the waiting list because of the lack of donor. And unfortunately, more than 10% of them deceased before receiving the liver transplant. Our goal in Ciprio is to develop an extracorporeal bioartificial liver device with a bioreactor containing hepatopores that can be available in any hospital and can be connected to the blood circulation of the patients. So the patient's plasma will be perfused over the hepatopores where the unmet liver functions will be compensated by the hepatopores and then the supplemented and purified blood will go back to the blood circulation of the patient. So our aim in Ciprio is to actually improve the health state of the patients with acute liver failure to bridge to liver region, and also improve the survival rate of the patients on a waiting list for a liver transplant. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for uh, all those great presentations. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back at uh, 4.15, if I'm right. Yeah, that works? Okay. Thank you. I'll see you later. everyone. Uh, now we're going to start uh, with our round table. So the theme of today's round table is building bridges between Europe and the United States uh, for disruptive science and startup. So I'll do a quick presentation of uh, our guest and then Antoine Papienic, who is the chairman of um, Sophie Nova, who is a major venture capitalist capital firm uh, in Paris uh, and who will be the moderator of our debate will take over from me. So uh, Stephen Quick, I don't need to introduce since I've already done it. Uh, we have Reid Hoffman who is the co-founder of Social Network LinkedIn and a partner at Greylock Partners which is one of the oldest uh, venture capital firm in the United States. An accomplished entrepreneur, executive and uh, investor. Reid Hoffman has played an important role uh, in building many of today's leading consumer technology businesses. He currently serves on the boards of Airbnb, Edmodo, Convoy, Blockstream, and has invested in many influential internet companies such as Facebook and Flickr. Uh, we have Tony Fadel, who is Fadel? Yeah. Fadel. Fadel, sorry, uh, who's been designing products and founding companies for the last 25 years. Uh, he's the founder and former director of Nest, uh, the company that pioneered the Internet of Things, and previously he led the team that created 18 generations of iPod and the first three generations of iPhones. Um, also, we have, I hope I pronounce your name correctly, Emai Partasarati, uh, who is the scientific director of Breakout Labs, the Thiel Foundation's program to support radical science-based startup companies. She's also a partner in Breakout Ventures, a new early stage fund that backs scientists and entrepreneurs working at the intersections of technology, biology, materials, and energy. And last but not least, Sebastian Amigorena, who is the director of the Immunity and Cancer Unit at INSERM and the head of the Immunology and Immunotherapy Department at Institut Curie. 
He's a member of the French Academy of Science and the recipient of several prestigious awards. Sebastien Amigorena sorry, has made critical contributions to the understanding of the molecular and cell biological mechanisms of antigen presentation to T lymphocytes. So will all those distinguished guests, I hope you'll enjoy the debate. Thank you very much. So thank you for, for attending that, uh, that panel with luminaries, we can say that. Um, I'm Antoine Papiernik, so I'm a managing partner, I'm a venture investor, I'm not a panel moderator professionally, you, you'll see that in a second. And um, it's not about my firm, just, just for you to know, so we are a venture capital firm, um, set up in 1972, of all places, in Paris. So, uh, 72 is the same year as Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins, so that's probably the only thing we have in common, but it's still historical fact. So, uh, Jean-Baptiste asked me to moderate this panel, um, and he said, you know, don't mess it up. So, uh, I actually made some, some comments, I even put some colors in it, so hopefully, and I probably won't look at it, but, you know, we'll, uh, we'll cover it. The question, the title of the panel is Build Bridges Between Europe and the USA for Disrupted Science and Startups. So I thought, okay, bridge, you know, it's a nice sort of stone thing, quite solid, uh, takes a long time to build, uh, you know, a small bomb can, can destroy it, it's not very flexible, probably we're talking about more, we heard about the brain and synapses and connections, and I think this is more what, uh, what we're going to be talking about. And w the first thing I wanted to do is sort of take a historical um, altitude. Uh, we... Um, you know, we can do it with Google Map, but if you think about this in, in time, clearly the last 30 years, Silicon Valley has produced amazing technology. I would say three of the most amazing. If you look at the top 20 technologies, you Google top 20 technologies. It's very simple, it's what I've done. And you go fire, you know, all the way back. So fire, the wheel, the, the nail, but of course then penicillin and many other things that, uh, uh, vaccination, of course, another French one. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the last three, the last 30 years have been pretty much uh, the US. Um, and I think there's still a huge amount of things we can learn from. I think why we are so happy and proud to have you here is what is it that we should learn that is not present here in Europe or um, in Paris or in France in, in, in particular that, that we could uh, emulate here in Paris. But I think, again, with this historical experience, we don't know where the next 50 innovations will be, the 50 years of innovation will be. Is it going to be in Europe? Is it going to be in China? Where is it going to be? And very likely, it's going to be everywhere. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to make sure that, that we capture that. You certainly are very well placed to tell us uh, about this. I'm going to have some, hopefully, pointy questions. Um, I'm the only French on the panel, so I guess you expect me to be rude. So I'll try and be as, as rude as I can. And, uh, You're only you half French. Uh, well, no, I'm French. No, I'm 100% French. Okay. Pure product. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, actually, Tony, I'm going to start picking on you. All right. Um, Pick on me. If that's okay. So, the first question is pretty simple, is why the heck are you here? Well, why am I here is we moved here with our family. J'habite à Paris uh, uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, it really started eight years ago when we, when we lived here, uh, this is the place where I actually uh, wrote the business plan for n what would become Nest. Did we get a royalty from the sale? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and so we just fell in love with not just the city, but um, there's so much inspiration that I, I gather and our family gathers from this city and this area of the world. So for us, and meeting a lot of people eight years ago and, and coming back every year and learning more and more about what has been changing here over the last eight years in terms of entrepreneurialism, these kinds of things, and also the democratization of technology. If you look back just 10 years ago, there weren't things like Android and open source, really prevalent open source. These things have now, technologies that Silicon Valley has created, some of them has created, has now been democratized around the world. So we can take these building blocks and use them and apply them to various industries all around the world. So to be here, to take those tools, to understand those tools and those connections, bring them here and look for new opportunities with new people. So one is selfish because I'd like to meet lots of new people and learn new things, but also take those tools and hopefully extract a lot of these great ideas and create companies, help people create companies in Europe and beyond. That's why I'm here. I like to go where other people don't. 
you know, I don't want to just follow the herd. It's like everyone wants, yeah, everyone wants to go to Silicon Valley. After 25 years, it's a wonderful place. But I'd like so, to go out and see other things. So it's not just good things. food and free education. <laughs> so there's other things. Could you, because you invented Nest, or you wrote the business plan here in Paris, could you have built Nest here? Then, could, and could you, could you do that now? Could I have then? Probably not then. Eight years ago, it was not the same Paris and France as it is today. Very, very diff different economic climate, political climate, um, uh, entrepreneurial climate. And so now, uh, and that's the reason why we came here, is because over the last five years, I've really seen a market change in terms of investors, entrepreneurs, that spirit, because we now have that app economy. And that app economy spurred developments all around the world, not just in France, but in China and everywhere else. So what do you think in the, uh, uh, certainly the model for us is this American, American psyche of, you know, sort of go west, my son, and <laughs> do, do it. Uh, we'll talk about that later, about, about failure and, and, and success, maybe a different. But what is it, according to you, in the in American psyche that makes it, that make, made the Silicon Valley outside of the resource? And, and, and what is it in the, in the people? Well, I think we it's, that, it's that open. And, and connections with people and just having, uh, being able to bounce things off and try things. Uh, you know, over time it became a culture of risk taking. It didn't at the beginning, you know, Silicon Valley's taken 60 years to become what it is. But that, that essence of risk taking and then f not fearing failure, but actually understanding that's the way we evolve and learn and be able to adapt and get onto the next one. So right now what I'm seeing is we're seeing first and second generation entrepreneurs here in France starting to that whole failure, uh, you know, that failure mechanism and learning, and they're getting better and better. I'm seeing better and better business plans, better and better businesses, because there have been previous failures that have caused them to adapt. About 20 odd years ago, I remember at a conference here in Paris, there was a prime minister that uh, was talking about entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, entrepreneur is a French word, another one. <laughs> and, and, and he said, uh, there's two things that French hate, success and failure. And, and I think these are two good reasons, I guess, why you describe failure, but success in Europe, yeah, you know, it's it, dodgy. It, it, it is for a certain generations. If I look, you know, especially eight years ago, if you were either successful or if you were failure or what have you, um, it was just frowned upon. You just weren't in that social system. The other one was also that there was a feeling like, why are the Americans taking it away from us? There's this book called Who Moved My Cheese? It felt like everybody was in this, who moved my cheese? They were all crying and, oh, complaining. Now the new generation, the 20-somethings, are saying, stop whining, we have to do something about it. And they're actually taking it upon themselves. And they're creating this, it feels like there's this kind of rift between the kind of old world and the new world that where there's the failures not is accepted there's you know places like station f and other incubators where failure is you know not encouraged but is uh, accepted and it goes on to evolve to something else so it feels like there is a new generation a new way of thinking especially look at the political climate now as well here which is i think very sane compared to many in the world um to allow this to happen Right, well, so there's hope, according to you. I wouldn't move Europe. here if there wasn't. Oh, yeah, fantastic. So maybe I'll, uh, and then we'll, you know, I have many more questions for you, but that I think we'll, we'll sort of, of, of run around and I'll uh, ask, uh, read a few things. And I, I've noticed, uh, checking you up, you know, on, on, on Wikipedia as well, or other, uh, you know, very interesting, very scientific um, uh, source of information that you, you studied uh, symbolic systems at, at Stanford. So I guess, uh, and you have well, so I guess words, <coughs> words matter. And uh, in, um, in English, venture capital, you know, venture. In, in French, it's aventure. You know, it's like adventure. Uh, in French, we call it capital risque. That's the trans direct translation, which tell, tells you about the fact that, you know, what we're talking about, there's, there's still some, some way to go, <coughs> including maybe changing that name. Um, and I also saw that you wrote this, this, um, this, book uh, recently called Blitz Scaling uh, about how do you sort of bootstrap, use the things that, that you've done in the Silicon Valley and uh, apply it to other fields or other territories. I mean, can, you, can we Blitz Scale uh, Europe, you think, on, on that regard? And can we, with what we have, can we get to the right level? Uh, so the book is in manuscript form, uh, might be published in October. Okay. Actually, that's, I'm going to try to make that decision on the plane flight back. Um, I hope not, <laughs> depending on what I said. I, no, 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 okay. no, no. No, my reading of the manuscript it was kind of a fresh read. And 
plane flights long enough to, to be able to, um, to focus. Uh, I am doing a podcast called Masters of Scale. I do uh, think that blitzscaling is possible everywhere in the world, and it's differentially easier and harder in, in places. I think the easiest places in the world it is to do is Silicon Valley and China. I think between capital markets, talent markets, uh, access to uh, the broadest possible markets for your products and services, uh, those places make it the easiest to do. But that doesn't mean it's only there. I mean, you know, for you know, uh, recent example in Europe, Spotify. Right? There's there's a there's a there's a stack of of interesting companies here. I think Europe is also not in the hardest. If you want to go hard, you go to you know various places in Africa, some places in Southeast Asia. You go, okay, those are harder <laughs> than doing it here. Um, but uh, there's hope. <laughs> yes. And so, and I think the rules are by and large the same, and a lot of the tempo for the speed that you move to scale is driven by essentially kind of uh, two questions. The primary one is competition, uh, but in a globalized world, in a networked world, competition tends to be more global. So it's, you know, you don't just kind of say, well, it's my own, only my French market. In the, in generally speaking, in the technology space, you're competing with any other uh, technologically developed com country that has entrepreneurs there and so you have to be global by focus and so competition uh, matters there and the second one is you know what's the critical mass for getting your business on scale uh, on you know kind of to the to a place where it's now in a moves from a the metaphor used for entrepreneurship is you throw yourself off a cliff assemble an airplane on the way down when is your airplane assembled <laughs> right what's the critical mass of that business um, but I think that the techniques are by and large the same with some modulo relative to how difficult it is, uh, whether it's raising capital, hiring talent that helps you get through scale, and then also what competition looks like. Great. So um, can we talk about politics here? I'm sure. Mm -hmm. All right. No. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> anyway. No, I'm here to escape politics. You know, I, <laughs> what are the, the trigger points? I, 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 anyway, so I... I was thinking about, uh, because this is what Europe and France in particular is trying to do, sort of a upscale, uh, try and get better. And uh, I remembered, uh, I did my MBA in the States many years ago, uh, so, uh, and I went there in 1990, so I'm, you know, I'm not in that generation, clearly. But uh, the book that came out in 1990 was Comparable Advantage of Nations by Michael Porter. And I actually went, uh, if I say Wikipedia one more, you're going to not like it, but I went on the web and I looked at uh, a quote from, uh, from uh, Mike Porter because I think I'd, lo I'd love your, your, your view on that. And it says, in a world of increasingly global competition, nations have become more, not less important. Nations succeed in particular industries because home environment is the most forward-looking, dynamic, and challenging. You know what I'm getting at here? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the question really is, Certainly, from our perspective, we feel uh, Europe and France in particular has a, a momentum, is trying to change things, even in a, uh, not real, I mean, there was as many US, uh, French company at CES than there was American companies, how crazy is that? But still, uh, so it may not be completely real, but we are trying hard. So uh, do you think, um, you know, the US is, is nationwide speaking uh, in a danger of losing its, um, um, sort of supremacy in that regard, in how the, in the people inside look at it. You know, some people even leave uh, uh, the, the U.S. And, and relocate somewhere else, or not. And I didn't use the T word, but <laughs> you can use it as much as you <laughs> possible. Uh, um, well, I would say that the current administration is doing its best to try to sabotage American position around the world and create world disorder. <laughs> um, and is making a certain amount of, of efforts in that direction. And I think that will have negative impact on, on um, you know, kind of industries as they get to scale. Uh, I, I do think it's kind of fundamentally is about can you empower projects like entrepreneurial projects that are for, you look more to the future than the past. I think Silicon Valley continues to do that uh, you know, kind of irrelevant to the administration. And, uh, and is kind of, like, I think one of the things that's really important, whether it's supporting entrepreneurship, whether it's figuring out what your future society is, is to say, look, what matters is the, um, uh, the good design in the future. And the past is uh, something to learn from, but if you try to enshrine it, you'll essentially guarantee a suboptimal future. 
Hey. By the way, I read uh, there was a survey uh, in Europe or across the world about how did uh, people, so out of US people viewed the US. And it's quite striking just in a year. Uh, they, they review this every year. I don't know if you've read this, uh, this survey, but it's incredible uh, to look at the change, uh, the very, very significant change in people's view of, of the US. I'm not, of course, uh, suggesting anything, but I'm saying uh, that uh, people's views can change quite rapidly. Uh, hopefully, as you said, there's some resilience in the system because uh, people just continue operating as they have been, fortunately, and, and uh, there's no, uh, the worst is not certain. So well, we hope to repair the uh, efforts to destroy the American brand around the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's get out of politics I mean, back to LinkedIn because uh, of course uh, uh, and the parallel between LinkedIn and what uh, is needed to bring uh, Europe, France to, uh, to, to the rest of the world, talking about synapse, synapses, this is what LinkedIn is today, synapses between people. Do you think that's, th there's, there's going to be other inventions like this or, or systems that allow us to, certainly on the science side, and I know there's some work mm. to, to this, uh, how do you make sure, because there's an incomplete information about science, mm. uh, and while we know that science bo is born at the same time in the same place across the world, China, uh, Armenia, I don't know where, but it's in, in, in the most funny place. You, what do you think of, of... So I think we are heading more and more into the networked age, I kind of you know, industrial age, information age, networked age. Part of the networked age, I think, is, is as information explodes, it's are the right memes, the right pieces of information, are they getting to the right sources in order to help accelerate progress? Whether that progress is science, progress is R&D, whether that progress is uh, bringing products or services to market. Uh, I think that is precisely one of the things that's causing the current uh, you know, acceleration of technology and the current deployment. And so I would say, you know, I don't know if there'll be one, you know, kind of like a scientific network um, with a closed end them or if there will be a set of different interlocking things, but I think we will see more and more of that, and I think that that's a good thing. Fantastic. Well, th thank you for, for the moment. We'll uh, go to... So, Hemai, you were a scientist um, turned venture investor. Um, I didn't say turn bad. I said... Because I could have said that as well for, for Reed, but... It's uh, a red lightsaber. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least I've never been a scientist, so... Uh, I call myself an accidental venture uh, Accidental, <laughs> okay. <laughs> accident, yeah, you had an accident, okay. Uh, so, but, and you, you now work with one of the biggest uh, luminaries as well, you know, uh, uh, Peter Thiel, uh, and you are at this interface between, um, uh, between science and, and venture. What, uh, according to you, is what triggers this radical innovation into translation to, um, to application? And what you see in, in, in the Bay Area, do you think that's applicable to other territories and applicable to, to Europe? So we got into the business of using philanthropy to support uh, scientist entrepreneurs because I think when I started as a scientist, I had this naive idea that we go on and we do basic research and then at some point we, we, we make this discovery and it is plucked by industry and brought into the magical real world to have an impact on society, right? And so I considered my place in this world as, as, as that scientist. Um, and I, I came to understand that that process of going from a scientific discovery to a real world innovation um, had a lot of problems in the sense that we no longer have corporations with the same level of early R&D. We don't have the Bell Labs. We don't have the people inside the companies that are able to pluck the fruits of academia and churn it and produce great things. And so instead, it seemed to be falling to the academics and, and this increasing push around academics need to be translational in order to try and push the technologies out the door and, and that there's a mismatch of incentives there. Academics have one set of priorities. Technological... Publications. Publications, right? They have incentives, they have hmm. rewards all around cutting edge advance, the Nature Paper, having worked at Nature for many years. I your fault, in fact. I, I could say that. <laughs> um, so that's why I left Nature and started <laughs> PLOS, but another story. So I think, uh, for me, the scientist entrepreneur is one key mechanism that can um, 
take the, the deep knowledge of a technology of a radical cutting edge scientific advance and bring it into a set of incentives to the startup company where it's aligned with trying to create a commercial product or a service. So for me, the, the, the startup is one of these key translational mechanisms mm -hmm. between great basic research and great company and, and ultimately products. Um, so that's how we got involved. And um, we support entrepreneurs around the United States that are um, taking technologies and taking the first steps to de-risking them and hopefully at that point getting other investors involved and corporate parts. There's been a development and a, and a maturation systems around the country to support these scientists entrepreneurs so when we started we would get applications from from people that had started companies and they were very uh, naive they were they were research projects and now we're seeing with universities starting uh, to support these people with incubators and with angel investors starting to circle them uh, particularly in you know in the Bay Area, in Boston, and a few other areas, we're starting to really see uh, a, a rising tide of these startups. That so much so that the, uh, the venture investors have gone down. You were telling me that earlier, and that you know, they are now putting 100 million behind things that are maybe not research ideas, but uh, uh, so there, there, there is a... Well, so these things come in waves, right? Yeah. So when we started in 2011, there was a dramatic pullback of venture capital. Uh, you know, it was all going towards the internet app, next dog walking app, whatever it is, right? And uh, the faster turnaround. And, and now in biotech at least, and in the US at least, definitely I think there's a hunger for... Um, uh, uh, to start with, I think it was a hunger for real value, mm. feeling that these other things were rather more frothy. Now I think biotech may itself be getting frothy in the Bay Area. So yeah. I agree. So it's less frothy here. <laughs> tell you. Okay. I mean, I give you an example. Uh, we had uh, a great presentation from uh, Thomas Iber at uh, DNA Script, which I think is a. It's okay. You didn't mention Sophie Novak. That's that's okay. No <laughs> one's going to know. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anyone. No. Uh, but you know, this is best of breed uh, DNA synthesis technology, the same sort of technology, not as good of course, uh, in the Bay Area raises 100 to 200 million dollars like this, which is what you need by the way, uh, in order to go to scale. But I would say that not all of them do, right? If you're coming out of a Bob Langer company or maybe a Steve Quake company, or maybe, you know, uh, now there are these, these folks that are luminaries. If, if, you know, if Mark Tessier Levine gets involved in a company, it'll, it'll raise these massive Series A's. If you look at the kinds of entrepreneurs we support that don't have those luminaries, it's a much slower, harder road. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a much more interesting time for funding those companies because you're finding a mix of philanthropy, of individuals who are investors but maybe have longer time horizons. A, a, a dynamic funding world too, I think, for those earlier, those startups that have to be scrappier. Yeah. So um, it's a question, and then I'll, I'll ask uh, Sebastian here, uh, because science seems to, science is born across the world. If you just if you take CRISPR-Cas9, for instance, so you know, gene editing, um, if you look at the IP battle around gene editing, it's just a good reason to tell you that it is born uh, in many different places in, in, in the world, in, in there in, in, in particular in Europe and the US, and then it's, it is used everywhere in the world, in particular in China. You don't know where the first application of, of CRISPR is going to proper, uh, proper or improper application will be uh, uh, on, on the globe, very likely in China. So uh, it's almost impossible to find a nature paper where you have just a French um, you know, author, you will have authors from across the, across the world. Is this, uh, is this, what you, is this a, a surrogate marker of, of this globalization? Or, uh, I mean, what, what is it? I think, um, and one of the reasons I'm here, which is, is really because I view science as a global enterprise and you have to keep your finger on the pulse across the globe in particular areas. So when I was in neuroscience originally, I would meet my colleagues from all around the world and I think there is a, a energy and a synergy to be found in cross fertilization of all kind, whether it's geographic or uh, disciplinary. Um, so I think, I don't know that it's, it's I think it's been enabled by the connectivity, again, mm. uh, it, more so than in the past. But it's certainly true that the best scientific discoveries and results are often that 
synergy. Yeah. And you could, you could say that you're getting it globally, but there's also benefits from doing it locally. So yeah. even within Paris, right, the map of all these different institutes, yeah. uh, there's, there's an opportunity for cross-fertilization That there. was very impressive, by the way. <laughs> I, I know it, of course, but looking at it, uh, yeah, be local, but, but, but behave globally, yeah. basically. That's uh, probably a good, uh, good, good lesson. Sebastian, maybe a question for, for you next. Uh, you're not European, you're not French, you, you uh, Argentinian, uh, came 30 odd years ago uh, to Paris. Uh, you went to the US to do, uh, to do a postdoc, but you came back. Uh, why? I'll stop here. Oh gosh, very personal. Um, I, it was not science, I came back because I liked, I, I became French, I mean, living, I, I left for the first time Argentina when I was six, and then to U Uruguay, and then from Uruguay to here when I was 13. So three years in the US, I mean, it was enough moving. I felt like home was France, and I felt very French. Okay. Uh, so so that, <laughs> that's not what I was looking at. <laughs> but that's, 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 no, that's a great answer. Now, you so. want the science part? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Let, let, me, let me just go back to my notes now, because I have uh, quite a few uh, questions for you. I mean, um, we know Europe is doing very well uh, on, on the science per capita. We were talking about uh, sort of nature publications. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're doing well. You're in a very hot and competitive field, which is uh, which is you know oncology basically. Uh, Curie is is one of the places in the world where this has actually started. I, I would argue. I remember Sophie Nova being. Uh, an investor in a company called Immuno Design Molecule back in 1995, which tells you that science is great, but timing is even more important because you know uh, that, that was difficult to be an immunotherapy company at the time. Now is the time. You are in the, the hottest uh, place in the world, but can you compete uh, here with the same means as your colleagues from uh, Boston or, or the Bay Area? Uh, and how, what do you do to survive, basically, in this world where there's so much more means in, in the U.S.? About, uh it's very, very hard. For, for fundamental research, I think the system works well. We, we are well-founded. We, we have the means, the infrastructure. What is really very, very complicated, and it's actually in the, in the field of immune oncology, it became a necessity. So you can do a lot of fundamental research, and then at some point, the field goes to therapeutics, for example, in the case of immunotherapy. And then... Uh, if you want to do that, um, we don't have what we need here. It's very, very hard. So we cannot compete. CTLA-4, which is the first antibody that was developed in, in melanoma, was discovered in France, in Marseille. Nothing happened. Translational... And PD-1 was invented in the Netherlands. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, we so invented the whole thing. Yeah. Just, it was... So, uh, now, you ask me, I think that there are many reasons for that. It's, and it's complicated, one of them, and I really liked what you described about what you are doing and, and that first step of fundamental scientists trying to do some application. It's very hard here for different reasons, but one of them is that not in the USPCE, which has... No, the USPCE is perfect. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> like Sophie Nova, I, yeah, I, I thank won't you. tell us. <laughs> but uh, in, in the French public research, people are not allowed to be involved in companies directly. So you can... Uh, do it as a counselor, you can bring your expertise to a company, but you cannot be part, acting part of a company. And many times, if you want to bring some ideas or discoveries or beliefs to, to, the, to the patients, you need to do it yourself. I mean, the expertise, the fighting spirit, and you have to just do those well, first steps yourself. And it's very, very hard. But it is know. better than it was, because I remember I started at the time where indeed it was illegal. You'd go to jail if you, were, if you had one share of the company that you were... Uh, yeah, that, that you wanted that to fund, pre-99, because there was a yeah, law on innovation in exactly. 99. Well, that's changed. A lot of people are able, you are able to go and have shares of companies, but I, I, you I can't be sitting on both sides of the fence, which often is needed. You, you cannot be executive mm. in a company, which is, I mean, I understand the ideology is fine, but that is what happens in many, many places. I, mean, I see my colleagues in the US, in, uh, in the Netherlands, in other places, uh, that are just have the labs, but kickstart the company themselves to make sure things are, are done correctly at the beginning. Um, and that is an important step, I think. I, I, I think that would help, at least. The other, the other thing that I really found was complicated in France as compared to the US is um, venture capitals. It's not, not you again. Um, <laughs> but you know, very often when I, when I meet with people and, and that have money to put in, in, 
early start up or seeding funds. What they want to know in France is when are you going to enter the clinics? So when is phase one going to start? In the US, again and again, at least I didn't have so many meetings, but they want to know what is the breakthrough, what is the you know, cutting edge, what is different from what other people are doing, and that is very important. And they don't have this failure. I, I, I really like what this about failure. That is not the question at the beginning. And I have the impression that in France, we, we foresee the failure and we want to know why this is not going to fail before getting excited about what is going to happen, even if it fails. Yeah, no, I think you, you're right. I think, you, you, you know, we haven't met for a while. This, this is why he's behaving <laughs> this way. Uh, but um, no, no, but it, it's true, but it's the mentality. It's the European mentality. We're talking about success and failure. It's the glass half, half empty. Uh, and that takes not even 30 years. It takes probably generations to change. It is getting it much is better. Getting better absolutely. Right? Uh, and so we, we are uh, taking the, the drugs uh, to, to get, uh, you know, to change that. But uh, yes, it is uh, part of the psyche uh, that uh, that is very difficult. To, you know, from the uh, go west, my son, you have you know the you know this is not going to work type uh, uh, attitude, and you need to yeah d deploy huge uh, energy to to change that. That's what's being done in many countries in Europe and in France in particular. But it's true that uh, I can see you you are you are still suffering from uh, from that. Uh, yeah, I from mean, that on the other hand, I, I'm very new to this, so. I was brought to trying to apply things because of the, the evolution. So I'm, I'm very impressed to be with you guys here, and I admire so much what you do. But I'm really uh, very, very young and new to this. Okay. So I have a lot to learn. I, I completely understand that part of it is me, um, and, and I'm learning. Yeah, I and I would argue that certainly <laughs> the venture, the venture um, feel has, has greatly improved. Uh, and people are looking for the next big thing in general, including preclinical early science that, that's going to be disruptive. I think everyone's looking for that. So uh, you know, do, do come and see us. <laughs> when, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you. We'll, we'll, uh, yes, I should say that uh, uh, with your field, uh, every, I guess everyone knows that, but uh, you know, there was the sale of Kite uh, to, uh, to Gilead uh, you know, for 12 billion. Uh, there's the, uh, there's the a very likely sale of Juno to uh, to Celgene uh, for six or seven billion in the next few days. Uh, we're looking for it. So your field is is one of the hottest field of of, of life science. Uh, so uh, if you've got something big, you should you should cherish it honestly. And and I think this is uh, this is immunotherapy has changed has started to change cancer, but it is still so small in, in the, the overall treatment of cancer. There's huge uh, promise there. So, uh, you know, you're the, you're the next frontier. So I think it's, uh, it's important that, uh, that you succeed. It may well be in Curie that, uh, that uh, the major sort of uh, the next CTLA-4 uh, or the next uh, PD-1 is, uh, is being invented. No one, no one knows that, back to the historical perspective. So uh, I, um, I want to move to... Um, to Stephen, we've heard about you. I think it was a very interesting uh, story. Uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, your ability to repeatedly bring something from an idea. It's not because it was a French book that that you know told you uh, most of what you you started with, but it was really this uh, serendipity. Uh, but you know, serendipity doesn't happen like this. You, you you're looking for things, and then poof, you bump onto something. It's 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 uh, Fleming and 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 uh, antibiotics. It's uh, this is how uh, looking at, at your uh, uh, you know your presentation, it felt like you you you, you had this mind of, of looking for things uh, where people were not necessarily looking, and then finding applications to that. So that was actually quite uh, quite interesting. Um, and in your current field, one of the fields in which you are in liquid, liquid biopsy, I was reading an article uh, in Science Today uh, about uh, cancer seek, uh, the results of the fir of, uh, of uh, it's the Johns Hopkins group. That's the Johns Hopkins Hill group. So I hope it's okay to mention the Johns Hopkins group. Absolutely, okay. that's fantastic. Right. And I, I mean, that's uh, it's, that seems to be the next revolution that we know and piles of venture capital money has been spent in liquid biopsy or in the US in the last uh, couple of years. But how far do you think that can go? Um, because we, of course there's cancer, uh, but then people are talking about uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, there's many other fields where, so maybe in, in your field, uh, how, how far do you think this, this could be uh, going? Well, I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, you know, a lot of praise for the American venture community here, and you know, I'll take a bit of a contrarian view there, that sometimes it seems like it's an intrinsically 
risky business populated entirely by risk averse people. Right? <laughs> and they all get phase locked on one idea and there you go. I mean, right now you can, you can stand on the corner of Sand Hill Road with a paper bag that says Amino Oncology on it. People will drop money <laughs> as they drive by. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit of worried liquid biopsies become that way in the cancer area. They're everybody kind of piled in there. And just enormous amounts of money have been, uh, have been put into it. Um, and, you know, there will be something useful that comes out the other end. Uh, and there'll be a winner with a lot of carnage along the way too. That's the other side of <laughs> yeah, there's, there's <coughs> so 500 combination there's trials with chemotherapy. Yeah. One survives, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you know, uh, I you know, like Tony was saying, I prefer to try to zig when other people zag, and uh, or zag when other people zig. And so I've avoided the cancer liquid biopsy area because it has been a very busy one, and there's very good people in the area, and it's clear there's going to be something good coming out of it. And uh, I felt there's been other frontiers to explore, and we went from prenatal to organ transplantation to infectious disease. Uh, we're spending a lot of time now thinking about cardiometabolic disease and neurodegenerative using cell-free RNA, um, which provides signals that you know don't require you to have another genome in your body. Um, and so I feel there's there's a lot of life left in the field, and there's going to be many creative things done, um, and it's going to continue to have this theme of helping people. Uh, replace these invasive biopsies with simple blood tests that are going to be quite informative. So uh, maybe a, a something about uh, uh, the biohub and the fact, again, uh, uh, here you're either a luminary or you work with luminaries. Or it's basically uh, here you have, uh, you know, uh, the, the Chan Zuckerberg uh, Foundation uh, backing you. What, what can you say about how, um, you know, how important this could be going forward? We've seen... Bill Gates and, and amazing work, sort of a second life, curing disease in the world, and it's just incredible to to to, to see the impact that uh, uh, that he, he has managed to have. Do you think that uh, I just went to you know the the Chan Zuckerberg website and you you listen to what they say, sort of the motto and huge ambitions. Uh, how big do you think that could be? Um, and and you know. I, What's your view of, of their I involvement and their uh, sort of uh, long-term potential impact on the world? Yeah. Well, I mean, Mark and Priscilla, their philanthropy is fantastic, right? I mean, they've, made, uh, they've announced a $3 billion commitment to science philanthropy over the next decade, uh, which is just absolutely stunning. And, you know, they've decided, they spent a lot of time thinking about how to do it. I mean, there are a lot of planning that went into their thoughts about how they wanted to do it. And, you know, I think they recognize that... Uh, you know, there's a couple of great biomedical, great science philanthropy in the U.S. right now, and I'd say the two dominant institutions are Howard Hughes Medical <coughs> Institute, which is Ivory Tower Basic Science, and there's the Gates Foundation, which is doing public health in the developing world. And you know, what was missing from the scene uh, was something that you know really bridged science and uh, human health, and was focused on advancing the riskiest ideas of science and technology that would lead to therapies to help people. Um, so kind of the third point on a triangle. And, uh, you know, they're going about trying to fill that need. And it's been great to be part of the Biohub, where we're a small piece of their philanthropy, uh, focused on the Bay Area and the three universities there, Stanford, UCSF, and Berkeley. Uh, and we've sort of been empowered to help the faculty at those universities work on their riskiest, most exciting ideas, things that wouldn't be funded by other sources. and. Uh, you know, it's the beginning of the experiment. We're about a year and three months into it, but uh, uh, it's just been fabulous to see how uh, 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 this funding is transforming people's research at the universities. Fantastic. So in a second, I'm going to ask um, if people have questions uh, to our panelists. So stop thinking about this because it'd be great to have, a, to have some questions. Maybe I have, a, uh, and I also would like you to maybe think about maybe there's some obvious things that I didn't ask you that you should be uh, saying, and so if you have uh, anything you'd like to say, please, uh, uh, please say it. That's the that's the next uh, the next part. Um, talking about life science, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Tony uh, and Reed, you, you've made your business and and you know uh, success in in the IT world. Uh, same with um, uh, Bill Gates, as we as we uh, said. And many other people who uh, became major people in the in the Silicon Valley, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, all all these the the Gafas and and you know Apple, all these 
enormous wealth that was built in the, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we certainly from our uh, life science, and we are a 100% life science fund, uh, we are amazed by how much money uh, they are starting to, uh, to invest in, in, in healthcare, and life science in general. <coughs> Is this because, you know, fear of death? Oh, sorry, sorry to say. Uh, is this, uh, is this uh, because you think there's a higher purpose that in a pyramid of, of life, uh, uh, you know, the pyramid of needs, let's say, healthcare is, is so much higher than anything else? Uh, and so my question is, is, is it invertly um, uh, directed or is this something that is directed to the world? So meaning, you know, when I, when I again go on to the, uh, onto the, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation website and, you know, they, they talk about the, the what really started this idea was the, the birth of their daughter, I think, or, or son, I can't remember. Uh, so someone realized at some point, wow, you know, uh, life is pretty important. Any personal views on, on why, uh, if you are investing in, in healthcare at all, and, and why would you do that? So, uh, absolutely. We've, we've been investing in healthcare, we've been investing in diagnostics. In, in tools and techniques as well as therapies. And that's because when we're looking at it, we're looking at the computational aspects. The IT aspects have now changed the way you do those things, the processes. And so with, the, with my knowledge and expertise on those kinds of um, technologies, when, when you see these other entrepreneurs coming from and researchers coming from the bio area, they need to be able to speak the language of technology to technology investors and vice versa. I'm learning to speak to the biological investors. So there's really a collision there that's happening and that it's really intriguing because there's lots of things that we've been doing for decades that really the, on the other side of the fence, they haven't, they don't have that experience and, and vice versa. That's, that's one. Two is obviously doing something better for uh, the humanity, right, and society. But then there's another very interesting one and that's maybe selfish on my part is that a lot of these techniques like we saw with brain imaging, with, um, uh, I'm, I'm also worried about the next generation of IT, neuromorphic computing. So how are we learning about the brain? What are we doing about AI and ML to be able to map, maybe learn from the brain and the physicality of what we have, and how are we translating that into silicon and software? So it's really about the collision of these things coming together um, that really intrigues me so I can learn and apply uh, um, expertise on both sides of the fence. Read it easy. Well, uh, so Greylock uh, essentially invests in three areas, um, consumer internet software, enterprise software, and then basically the kind of new spaces where no one's an expert, right? So if other people are experts and we're not, they should invest. We, we, we shouldn't, it's, you know, like you bring us battery technology, we go, okay, these other guys are good at that. You bring us a classic life sciences company, say, well, these other guys are good at that, you know, we shouldn't do that. Um, so where we have touched uh, life sciences is primarily a little bit what Tony was alluding to is where our expertise in software uh, tends to have some kind of very interesting differential advantage in how the company is either building its products or services, going to market, uh, something that, that, that ties to our areas of expertise. Um, there's an occasional exception to that, which is, oh, we know this entrepreneur, we know this entrepreneur for 10 years and now they're doing this, okay, fine, because our differential knowledge is the entrepreneur. Um, and so, you know, I'd say is we're doing some, uh, but not necessarily uh, lots. Okay. But on the personal level, do you think that's, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if you invest only through Greylock or if you, if you have, uh, you know, if, if like uh, Tony, you think uh, doing, uh, doing some personal investments in, in healthcare is, uh, is useful or, or, or what's your view on that? Um, I'm probably definitely open to it, but one of the questions is, you know, getting expert enough to be able to do something. Like I, even when I do investments in, you know, I have a, I have an investment in a supersonic plane company. I have an investment in a, uh, you know, kind of a space propulsion company. Even when I do those things, I like to know that I have some differential angle of expertise and ability to help. And so... I've heard someone said recently uh, the concept of spot the sucker. I don't know if you... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. It was you, I think. But yes, uh, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you can't spot... It's the pr an, an investing analogy to poker, which is if you can't spot the sucker, you are the sucker. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And <laughs> yes. I'll remember that. Uh, <laughs> make sure I, I remember that. So uh, is there any questions? I have many more questions, but 
Are there questions in the room that people are dying to ask? And I can't see any hands, so if there is, there's one at the back. Is there a mic? Yeah. Can I just briefly add to this yeah, discussion? Please, please, please. I, I just wanted to say that um, one of the things that I was talking about angel investors, quite often they're not in, from the bio world, but want to invest in bio for reasons that we've talked about. And I think one of the things that we've been able to do is provide a level of validation <coughs> that gives comfort to folks that are interested but don't feel that they have the ability to diligence mm -hmm. these companies. So we quite often find that the companies that we invest in after doing scientific due diligence, which for us involves peer review from experts from the academic community as well as venture level diligence, once we've done that, we find that they're, the companies have, have sort of circled people that are interested and are ability, able to raise the next couple of million that really gets to the point where the VC world start to take yeah. notice. Like you, you, you ticked the box from what you were talking about. So, f so trying the, the to find ways uh, of, of <laughs> providing that independent validation for interested um, yeah. ecosystems mm -hmm. can be really important and helpful. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Question at the back. Go Karen from uh, Light On. Um, I have this uh, very stupid question. Uh, the Silicon Valley itself started as a mostly a government effort. Uh, mostly military and satellite and so forth that led eventually to a Silicon Valley uh, thing with companies coming out of it and eventually doing their own thing and everything. Um, when Paris is looking into the Silicon Valley as being a way to essentially emulate a little bit uh, that thing, uh, essentially that, that path, how do you guys think uh, at the time we are at now uh, how the government could uh, help in some, f uh, some examples uh, here in Paris, uh, the activities that are going on, to essentially go through that path where eventually we go into a Silicon Valley-like type of uh, uh, city where uh, we have the whole capitalistic thing uh, going on and not remembering the, the whole government uh, support in the first place. Hi. Anyone who wants go, to answer? Yeah, go oh, um, look, there's a couple of classic patterns. Uh, governments can make it uh, easier to form companies. Uh, you know, one of the classic things that uh, has troubled France over the last few decades, probably on entrepreneurship, Macron's obviously, and the government is a huge step uh, forward. Uh, but one of the uh, questions is labor laws, right? If you can't actually, in fact, go try something with 10 or 15 people and go, oops, it didn't work, and, <laughs> and reform, that makes it super difficult to kind of start companies. So uh, kind of those issues around uh, labor laws and company formation. Uh, you know, uh, for example, one of, there's a really interesting book, if you want to get a sense of kind of differential, is um, called Regional Advantage by Annalise Sixinian, who she asked herself the question of if venture capital, venture capital is essentially invented in Boston by a French expatriate. General Doriot. Yep. yep. Georges uh, was George. his first name, yes. Yep. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and so, you know, since uh, Boston nominally has all the same things that Silicon Valley does, technology companies, uh, high technical universities, venture capital is invented there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it that uh, essentially Silicon Valley has massively outstripped Boston in a variety of areas? And, you know, part of the answer was actually this open network that, that uh, Tony was referring to. But part of that is, for example, non-competes are uh, not basically enforceable in California. Yeah. And the reason that's important is because a non-compete isn't really about, uh, uh, most often isn't really about stealing IP. It's about the large company being able to grind the small company uh, and therefore, again, is, is an unfavorable to entrepreneurship and creating new things. And so that's the kind of scope of things that you, the first blush, the most important thing for the government to do is to enable all that, sort of the formation of those firms. Next thing is, uh, you know, the, the governments can, for example, be interesting early uh, funders of technology or purchasers, right? Because like actually frequently getting a company off the blocks is what is your first you know, kind of contract or two, depending on what the space is in, that can actually be very useful. So there is a stack of things that can affirmatively be done, but um, first and foremost is let the entrepreneurs run. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have, a, I have a list of 15 points that I've been <laughs> create, been co creating, uh, you know, enlisting more over time and sharing with the government that things that could be addressed and fixed here. But then there's another thing, you know, that's happening in the government, you know, all the time. And, um, is when are we going to create the next Google? When are we going to create the next Facebook? And I think that's the wrong question. 
a lot of people are looking to the past and saying we need to have a success like they did. And it's like, no, we have to look to the future and then project ourselves what is coming and then look for success in those, as opposed to saying, well, in three years or four years, it's not that big, so therefore it's not a success. So I think the definition of success or the view of it needs to change and look forward more, mm -hmm. as opposed to in the rearview mirror, because what happened in the, two, the early 2000s is not gonna happen again here. It's, it may, it might be a fluke, but at the end of the day, we have to go back to principles back in the 90s of how we were creating, you know, or yeah, pre-98, 97, creating companies than, than, than we did in 2006, 7, 8. So um, that's, that's another thing. Um, uh, the one thing that I've felt um, going around to the different universities in the UK, here in France, Germany, uh, Belgium, uh, as well as an uh, the Netherlands, is that each university has very, very different ways of transforming their research into, into um, you know, real, you know, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial companies. And so I found different pockets of that around France, but there's not really a, you know, if we look at how long it took for Stanford to get where it is today, or, or MIT to really spin out these startups, there's not this culture or um, that allows the researchers to leave the institutions to come back as we were discussing. Mm. And we really need to get this semi-permeable membrane mm. to happen and also allow failure to happen to let them come back to their mm. things. There's, you know, if I look at the Netherlands, there's some amazing research around ag tech and biotech around there, mm. but they, it is just research, <sighs> nothing spins out. Mm. Then if I go to somewhere like Cambridge, it's a different story, Oxford's a different story here as well. So I think the, there it needs to be a, a really good discussion about that and looking at the models um, as, to, as you've seen that work and see how they can be applied mm. here and the government needs to back it because there's way too much of this, oh, uh, you know, if they're on a board, if they have this, what, is the, mm. what does it do for their research funding, these kinds of things. It needs to be an op openly talked about mm. because this is, it's not going to be competitive. Mm. It, it's going to stifle competition, mm. uh, competitive nature here in, in the country. Thanks, that, that makes total sense. Just a historical perspective, is I've been a venture investor for 23 years and you know, in France, but investing around Europe and the U.S. And clearly, I mean, th things have massively changed here. From the law on innovation, 99, you'd go to jail if you, if you had a share from a company. Right. You know, today, people, it's completely different. Look at what, you know, BPI, the French uh, sure. uh, sovereign fund bank has, has done, you know, including, by the way, investing in venture investors like ourselves. Huh? So uh, the whole ecosystem, and it's not just Macron, Macron is, this, is the next stage and clearly is pushing this to, to a different level, but it has started some, some, uh, you know, some uh, tens of years back and we are in a much, much better. Much situation. better than it was, but there's still a, oh, a long no. way to go. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, absolutely. Continue you know, to push. I'm the optimist continue here, you know, so I'm looking at the glass half full. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Keep pouring the water. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. That's the only way. <laughs> Any other questions in the... Yeah, there's another one here, and then maybe this one. I don't know how much time we have, another 10 minutes or so, or... We'll see. Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. So I'm Florent from uh, Micro, Micro Factory. Um, it may be a, quite a French way of thinking, uh, the, you know, glass half empty, but um, know that uh, academies and university are uh, more and more... Um, Encouraged to, of course, launch startup and uh, and um, and uh, applied research. Um, I know that uh, funding also. Uh, they know that they have. Uh, they are judged on the sometimes the amount or the uh, the the environment they provide to startups. Do you think that there might be? Um, um, Middle or long term uh, decrease in uh, the moti in the um, impetus for uh, really fundamental research which has no uh, visible field of application, or will it uh, still uh, manage to keep an equilibrium? Will there still be a good Sorry. equilibrium between the uh, the two parts of these uh, uh, these universities? Well, one thing we professors are really good at are producing new PhDs and <laughs> chronic oversupply of scientists. Um, and so I think there's you know, more than enough uh, human capital uh, being trained and created to fill both sort of the very fundamental world and the applied world. Um, I think you were asking a slightly different question about whether there would be a decrease in support for basic research. 
as a result of the, the emphasis on application. And m my hope is actually that it will be the reverse, that there will be, I think right now there's an increasing pressure, at least on the US, to, to validate the translational impact of the work that they're doing. You know, it, it, whatever it is, it's, if it's working on brain science, it's going to affect autism or Alzheimer's, that's the opening paragraph of, of whatever you're, you're trying to do. And my hope is, is that if we have sort of a clearer sense of where the, the translational activities are best placed, that there will be a, a recognition, a greater recognition of the value of basic research. But maybe that's an optimistic perspective. Uh, I agree with that. I think universities are not very good at doing the translation <laughs> themselves. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's some things that are just best done in a company. Anything interdisciplinary is generally <laughs> best done in a company. No one's worried about who's going to be the last author on the paper. Right. Sebastian, you have a view? No, I mean, that is a, a real danger in, in, in pushing translational and, and uh, in applications that all the money gets shifted, and then you forget about fundamental <coughs> research. And it's a, that would be the worst. I mean, I really, if uh, the danger for that is huge, and I hope people in charge know that we will be dry in 10 years, we will be dead if we don't support fundamental science independently of any application at the highest level. And I really think in the US, it's very impressive to see to what extent universities continue to support fundamental research, and the system is very well laid up. It is not the same here, and th that danger exists. And right. we see that financing shifts towards applied. But generally speaking, in the US, the universities aren't supporting research. No, well, uh, NIH. They, they give you a room to hang your shingle and write grants no, no, and such right. forth. So the support the is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yes, the government agencies have had a phenomenal commitment exactly. to supporting exactly. basic yeah. science. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of the secrets to the US's historic success in that has been. There's not just one agency, and there's multiple agencies covering any given area. And so if you fall between the cracks with one for any given reason, there's another one that might support you. And having kind of this multi-tiered approach where there's a bunch of independent organizations that are kind of making separate decisions about what they want to fund uh, has been a real strength of the system. That being said, I mean, I think the problem now is less so much fundamental versus applied, but risk averse versus risk taking. And you know that that's what we're trying to fill the biohub is, you know, get to that front end, do the very riskiest things, uh, and give them a chance to succeed. And the ones that that are successful will go on to federal funding and that sort of thing. But it's that first little bit that's that's often the most challenging part for academics to get. In but but if, if if I think you were right with the uh, with the Pasteur quote, you know, it's it should be a continuum from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Indeed, those 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 focus uh, those waves are. are are not uh, real, they should not be. So there should be an homeostasis. So, so you use that term, someone used that term about, you know, uh, uh, the balance between the very early, you need the early. I would say for certainly from the venture investor, more and more people are looking for the radical, uh, earth shattering a new yeah. science. And therefore uh, that should uh, normally uh, allow uh, the, the, uh, the, the really great innovations to, uh, to, to start from the fundamental to, the, uh, to, to, to come to the application line. Again, I'm the optimist, yeah. likely. There was a last question. Maybe we, we have a question, and I think we are going to be done with time. So <coughs> last so question from... Actually, this is related to the uh, questions uh, that we were talking about. Um, so he may told us about how difficult it is to move basic research that's going on on the academic side to the application and to the commercialization. And I see that as more bottom-up approach, right? And there can be top-to-bottom approach, meaning I would like to uh, see if how we can approach, like starting from um, already commercialized product, like doing research on food industry or more uh, diagnostics or already available research that on the um, market or in the medical side and we can do more research so what are your opinions on top to bottom approach of doing research I, does that make sense I, I think you're saying are there people going out and looking at researchers and then pulling it out is that what you're saying not doing more research on let's say like food industry or like already uh, presented the products and we do more research on so, so the market. So let me help here. I think, uh, I think in, for instance, in, in life sciences, you can have a new uh, chemical entity, something a new, uh, uh, best in, I mean, 
new class of drugs that, that interact with, with a new phenomenon, a new receptor. Or you can have what they call new therapeutic entity. You take a drug that's been going on forever, uh, you know, uh, aspirin, okay? And then you try and find therapeutic uh, use mm -hmm. for that drug. So in terms of, uh, there's no real science in the, um, you know, in, the, in the molecule itself, but there's a real potential innovation. It's maybe more towards the consumer. Uh, how can you use, today there are many uh, patients that have problems I think that may be a way. I don't know if anyone has a has an um, opinion about taking something that is already there and then uh, taking it to the next step, maybe. We certainly see, we don't fund because just the way our mandate is set up, but we certainly see very um, several companies going out there and, and I think quite successfully as startups trying to, taking already essentially produced technologies and repurposing them to to solve other problems. Mm. And it, you know, it's an area certainly in healthcare, you see these off the shelf sensors are being used and, and wireless technologies and battery technologies are being integrated to solve new problems. Mm. So I think there is a wealth of technology sitting on the shelf mm. ready to be combined in to, to solve problems. I'm not sure that addresses it. But so, thank you, <laughs> Um I think we're gonna stop here. I would like to really thank uh, the, the panelists. It's been a joy. I think everyone's really happy that you um, made the move and came for the for the Americans here. Uh, we understood, Sebastian, you're French, and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and and but you know both of us are very happy that uh, that you came and that you uh, interacted with us. And so thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Are we done? <laughs> is the day? The, yeah, the, the day is, is finished. Excellent. All right. Thank you.